Welcome everyone, today in Rich and Spiritual, presents The Joys of Living, Volume 2 by Orison Sweat Martin. Chapter 1, The Tragedy of Postponed Enjoyment The mill will never grind with the water that has passed. There was once a very brilliant and charming young man, who made up his mind that he was going to devote the first half of his life to the amassing, of a million and the balance in the unstinted enjoyment of his money. He resolved to sacrifice every conflicting desire in pursuit of his one unwavering aim, to cut off everything which could possibly conflict with his life purpose. He hushed the great longing in his heart for music and sacrificed his soul's calling for the beautiful, for art, until he could get the means for answering all these calls in his nature which bade for his attention. Later, he felt sure, he would revel in art and music. But when this young man had made his first million he found that his ambition called for another million, and he resolved to work a little longer and to quit when he had two millions. When he reached this point, however, his ambition had grown to monstrous proportions and kept calling for more, more. He resolved to break away and to enjoy what he had, but he soon found that he was slaving under ambition's lash and he kept going on and on, making greater sacrifices of his finer nature, until one day he caught a glimpse of himself in a long mirror. He was shocked at the gray hairs and wrinkles, at the bent form. For a moment he could not believe his eyes, but the truth very soon became painfully evident, and he resolved then and there to quit the money game and to start on his quest of pleasure. But he very soon found that he had lost his taste for many of the things which called so loudly in his youthful blood. When he began to travel, he was surprised to find that the great masterpieces of architecture, painting, and sculpture, which he had dreamed would give him such pleasure, were closed books to his mind, because his aesthetic faculties had become so atrophied that they no longer responded to stimulus. He then resolved that he would make a business of surrounding himself with friends for the balance of his life. But his friendship faculties had also gone out of business for the lack of exercise. He had sacrificed his friendships in pursuit of the dollar. He felt sure that music, his first love, had not gone back on him and he went to the great centers of music to revel in the opera. But he soon found that his musical faculties had gone out of business also, atrophied from the lack of exercise, and so, in his desperation, he turned from one thing to another trying to enjoy himself, but he found that even dissipation no longer could give him satisfaction, he had lost all power of enjoyment, so that his fortune was but a mockery to him. He had sacrificed youth, health, his friends, his taste for music, for art, for literature, and he stood like a great skyscraper which had been ravaged by fire a burned-out old man with a fortune, but with no power to enjoy it. He had money, but nothing else. There is little except the form left to indicate that such men are human. Most of the qualities which make for real manhood, the sweeter, nobler, grander, sublimer qualities, which make normal men and women godlike, have been burned out of the life by the dollar mania. The time will come when these human monsters with vast fortunes, will be looked upon as enemies of all that is highest and noblest and sweetest and cleanest in human life. Men and women will not always bow down to the golden calf. The only way to be happy is to take advantage of the little opportunities that come to us to brighten life as we go along. To postpone enjoyment day after day and year after year, until we get more money or a better position, is to cheat ourselves not only of present enjoyment, but also of the power to enjoy in the future. One of the greatest tragedies of life is the postponement of enjoyment. I think the one great regret of most people when nearing the end of life is, that they did not live as they went along, that they attempted to postpone their enjoyment instead of living to the full each day as it came. How often we see young people start out in life with small capital and work like slaves for years, putting aside every opportunity for pleasure or relaxation, 
denying themselves the luxury of an occasional outing, the attendance at a theater or concert, a trip to the country or the purchase of a coveted book, even postponing their reading and general culture until they have more leisure, more money. They delude themselves with the thought that when the following year arrives they will take life easier, perhaps indulge in some of these things, but when next year comes they think they must economize a little longer. Thus they put off every enjoyment from year to year. They think that next year they will be able to send their boy or girl to college, but the habit of saving, the craving for a little more money gets the better of them and again they postpone. At length a time comes when they decide they can afford to indulge in a little pleasure. They go abroad, or try to enjoy music or works of art, or attempt to broaden their minds by reading and studying. But it is too late. They have become hopelessly wedged into the rut the years have made about them. The freshness of life has departed. Enthusiasm has fled. The fires of ambition have died down. The long years of waiting have crushed the capacity to enjoy. The possessions for which they sacrificed all their natural and healthy longings for joy and brightness have turned to dead sea fruit. Such lives are repeated in thousands of homes about us. On every hand we see these burned out lives. This country is full of wrecks of people who have forfeited their reputations, their health, their homes, their vacations, their opportunities for travel, for reading, and culture, their friends, in fact, traded everything that was worthwhile, for money. Has it paid? Thousands of men are nervous wrecks, practically friendless and homeless, as far as the things we prize most in a home are concerned, and all because of a desire to scrape together a few more dollars. Does it pay? Many a man has lost his life while trying to save a hat, or an umbrella, or a package in front of a trolley car, automobile, or carriage. What a foolish thing this is, we say, but there are tens of thousands of men in this country, who have lost about everything in their lives that was worthwhile, trying to get a few more dollars away from somebody else. The sacrifices we Americans make, the price we pay for our fortunes is something appalling. Just take a look at the physical and mental wrecks we see on every hand. Does it pay to sacrifice the very thing for which we live, to get together a little more money? How often we see hungry, cadaverous men with great big pocket books. They have the money but that is about all they have. Did you ever think, Mr. Selfish Greedy Man, of what you are losing on your way to your wealth? Did you ever realize that while you are gloating over the fact that you are getting ahead much faster than those about you, that you are losing something which is infinitely more precious? Nature keeps a one-priced store. She lets you take whatever you want, but you pay the price for it, and you often leave that which is infinitely more valuable than what you take. How many take the money but leave their character in exchange? How many swap their ability, their education for dollars? How many exchange all that is finest, most delicate, and sweetest in their natures for that which can only give a coarse satisfaction, can only feed the animal appetite? While you are grasping for more greedy dollars, your manliness may be oozing out, your nature may be hardening, your sympathy for your kind may be drying up, your affections may be becoming marbleized. You may find that you like coarser things than formerly, that refined, cultured, educated, good people do not interest you as they once did. You are sliding down. Greed has lowered your standard. I know businessmen who think they have made a great success in life, because they have gained a fortune, who would not recognize a photograph of themselves taken when they started out in the dollar chasing game, for they have exchanged for dollars the most valuable things which they possessed at the start. Business diplomacy, cunning, have taken the place of their former simple, open straightforwardness. Their motto, business is business, has completely changed their life. Business policy has taken the place of principle, of conviction. 
The man who cultivates the habit of enjoyment, who avails himself of the opportunity to indulge in some innocent pleasure, to brighten and broaden his life by listening to good music or looking at rare works of art, studying the beauties of nature or reading an inspiring book, will unconsciously find himself far ahead in the race for success. He will be much less selfish and greedy and far more sympathetic and more in touch with his times, than the man who postpones all enjoyment and relaxation until he has accumulated a fortune. There is nothing more delusive than the idea that we are going to do something tomorrow which we believe we cannot afford today. Miss Mulock has well said, in one of her books, nobody will see his own blessings or open his heart to enjoy them till the golden hour has gone by forever and he finds out too late all that he might have had and made and done. How many people make slaves of themselves, pinch and scrimp and practice grinding economy all through the best years of their lives, with the firm belief that they are getting ready for great enjoyment in the future? Oh, the waste of life, the precious years lost getting ready to enjoy. Oh, the delusion of always putting the time of enjoyment in the future, forever deferring good things until the tissues have hardened and the nerves have lost their power to carry agreeable sensations. How many people there are who murder their capacity for enjoyment and make slaves of themselves in trying to hoard up that which they might have enjoyed in their younger days, and which will be but a mockery to them late in life. It seems strange that level-headed businessmen, who have been such a success in their line, should not be able to see that they cannot really enjoy themselves, after retiring from an active, busy life, unless they have a broad training outside of their specialty. After all, what are the things which men expect to enjoy after they retire? It would be a good thing for a man who is thinking of retiring to test a few of the things which he fancies he is going to find enjoyment in after giving up an active life. For example, let him go to the opera. The chances are that he would be bored to death all through the performance. How could he expect to enjoy the opera if his musical faculties had not been developed? Then let him visit the great art galleries. The average businessman would get tired of this sort of thing inside of two days. His mind had not been trained in that direction. A lifetime of training in a business career had not developed qualities which would help him to appreciate the beauties of art or to measure art values, to see the meaning in the great masterpieces. Then, let him try travel, which he thinks is going to be such a delight. He would probably get very tired after a few months wandering from place to place, living without the comforts and luxuries to which he is accustomed in his own home. If he knew how to play golf, he might get considerable satisfaction out of that, but if he overdid it, he would very soon tire of it. He might try philanthropic work, helping the poor, but it is likely that, whatever he did, his mind would constantly be reverting to and longing for his old occupation. The chances are that he would very soon weary of playing at life. The faculties which had been made dominant by so many years of active service, would be constantly pulling him towards his business or profession. The great secret of happiness is to learn to enjoy as we go along. Every day should be a holiday in the highest sense of the word. No matter how busy we are, something should be brought into every day's experience which will enlarge, broaden, and enrich the mind. Every day should add a new layer of beauty and joy to life before it gives place to the morrow. It was not intended that one part of life should be filled with joy and the remainder be left barren. It doesn't pay to look forward to enjoyment. A recent writer says, would as soon chase butterflies for a living or bottle moonshine for a cloudy night. The only way to be happy is to take the drops of happiness as God gives them to us every day of our lives. The boy must learn to be happy while he is plodding over his lessons, the apprentice while he is learning his trade, the merchant while he is making his fortune, or they will be sure to miss their enjoyment when they have gained what they have signed for. There is an Eastern legend of a powerful genius, 
who promised a beautiful maiden a gift of rare value if she would pass through a field of corn, and, without pausing, going backwards or wandering hither and thither, select the largest and ripest ear, the value of the gift to be in proportion to the size and perfection of the ear she should choose. She passed through the field, seeing a great many well worth gathering, but always hoping to find a larger and more perfect one. She passed them all by, when, coming to a part of the field where the stalks grew more stunted, she disdained to take one from these, and so threw to the other side without having selected any. This little fable is a faithful picture of many lives, which are rejecting the good things in their way and within their reach, for something before them for which they vainly hope, but will never secure. On a dark night and in a dangerous place, where the footing is insecure, a lantern in the hand is worth a dozen stars. The high school boy thinks that he will be happy when he enters college, the freshman is dreaming of the day when he will be a senior, the senior, of the time when he will be graduated, the graduate lives only for the propitious hour when he will go into business for himself or start in his profession, and the young man who has just entered on an active career looks forward to the happy time when he shall have saved enough money to build himself a beautiful house. But by the time he has built his fine house he has become so bound by his business, or profession, so absorbed in the everyday routine, that enjoyment must be pushed still further ahead, until he can spare a little more time from his business or office, or to the indefinite season when he shall retire. He alone is the happy man who has learned to extract happiness, not from ideal conditions, but from the actual ones about him. The man who has mastered the secret will not wait for ideal surroundings, he will not wait until next year, next decade, until he gets rich, until he can travel abroad, until he can afford to surround himself with works of the great masters, but he will make the most possible of what he has now. If we would see the color of our future, said Canon Farrar, we must look for it in our present, if we would gaze on the star of our destiny, we must look for it in our hearts. The majority of us go through life with our eyes fixed on a distant goal, straining every nerve to reach it. On our way we pass indescribable beauties of earth and sky, and innumerable opportunities to help others over rough places, to brighten and beautify the commonplace life of every day, but we see them not. Heedless of all that does not point directly toward what we consider the winning post, we finally arrive at our destination, to find what? We have, perhaps, gained what we sought, wealth, the secrets of science, fame, we have satisfied our ambition, it may be, but at the cost of all that sweetens, beautifies, ennobles, and enriches life. The man who has spent all the best years of his life chasing dollars and neglecting everything else, developing one big money gland in the base of his brain to secrete dollars, and letting the upper part of his brain, his ideality, his aesthetic, his social faculties, his friendship faculties, atrophy, and other higher intellectual faculties dwindle, cannot expect to enjoy much of anything outside of the rut and routine in which he has spent his life. He will be lost when he gets out of it. He will find that, outside of these few tracks in his brain, formed by his routine life, he will get very little satisfaction, because his whole brain has not been developed. It is sad to see a man who has ground his very life into his business, coined his brain and his very soul into making a fortune, because he believes that this will be a panacea for all his ills, who, after he has his fortune in hand, still feels the same emptiness, discontent, the same unsatisfied heart yearnings. Everywhere we see men who have led the commercial life so long, who have pursued it with such zest and such eagerness and grit that they have crushed all of the finer sentiments, all the nobler attributes, out of their natures. They have become money-making automatons, getting on specialists, and they are good for nothing else. They are miserable the moment they are taken out of this atmosphere. Their fortune made, they have nothing to which to retire. No matter how much money you may have, Mr. Rich Man, 
your enjoyment must come from the qualities and faculties which you have been exercising the most during your active career. If you have been kind and considerate, if you have been just and generous with those who have helped you to make your fortune, if you have developed your friendship faculties, your social qualities, if you have been just and true during your money-making period, if there are no dirty dollars in your pile, if you have not trampled others down in your climb to your fortune, if you have developed your benevolence and generosity, you will be happy. You will enjoy what you have accumulated, but the habits of your past life, the tendencies of your developments will determine the quality of your happiness. Is it not strange that when a man has been developing his selfish qualities, his greed, his grasping nature for a quarter or a half century, and has allowed his friendship faculties, his affection, his generosity, and all of his noble qualities to die from lack of exercise, he should expect that the mere possession of a fortune could transform all of his life habits and give him the enjoyments which could be possible only with the highest development of the grandest qualities in him, instead of the lowest, the animal propensities. We treat our joys as one of my neighbors did her choice currants, says a writer. Let's have a pie, said the children, when the bushes began to bear. But the mother would not hear of using such fine fruit green, it must ripen. When the currants were ripe, the children begged them for the table, but the mother had decided to save them for jelly. When jelly making was proposed, she wanted to wait until other work was out of the way, and she could do it as it ought to be done. But lo, when she was fully ready, the sun, the birds, and an unexpected storm, had all been there before her, and the bushes were bare. That's the way we do with our blessings and gladnesses, the mercies that are new every morning. We say, oh, how I could enjoy this if, and then we let the trial, foreboding, or trouble crowded out of place. Some day we expect to be ready really to enjoy our health, our home, our friends, but who can promise us that when that long postponed day comes the fruit will still be on the bushes? Chapter 2 Intellectual and Aesthetic Joys Milton in his blindness saw more beautiful visions, and Beethoven in his deafness heard more heavenly music, than most of us can ever hope to enjoy. Had I but two loaves, said Muhammad, would sell one and buy hyacinths to feed my soul. President Eliot once said to his Harvard students, you ought to obtain here the trained capacity for mental labor, rapid, intense, and sustained. It is the main achievement of college life to win this mental force, this capacity for keen observation, just inference, and sustained forethought, and everything we mean by the reasoning power of man. That capacity will be the main source of intellectual joys and happiness and content throughout a long, busy life. I believe that the cultivation of the power of appreciation would alone increase human happiness a thousand percent. Most people confound pleasure and happiness. Pleasure is a more temporary enjoyment. It is the soda water enjoyment compared with the enduring satisfaction which comes from the appreciation of a good book, or the enduring satisfaction which comes from the cultivation of the intellectual, the unfolding of the mental powers. There are multitudes of closed doors in an untrained mind, which, if opened by education, training, and culture, would enrich the life wonderfully and would lead to untold happiness. Who can estimate what it means to a human being who is a lover of the beautiful to have the door of his aesthetic faculties opened? How the early cultivation of the love of the beautiful would magnify all of the beautiful things in the world. Many people go through life beauty blind because their aesthetic eyes have never been unsealed. We only enjoy what we can appreciate, and our appreciations are along the line of our training, our experiences, and our hereditary tendencies. The music which ravishes one person may mean nothing to another. A bit of landscape, a glorious sunset, a masterpiece of art would send a thrill of joy through the heart of a Ruskin, while another person would get no enjoyment from the same experience. 
Everything in life is loaded with some special meaning, but will only give up its secret to the soul that responds to it, the soul that has an affinity for it. Music does not awaken response in the deaf ear but only in those who have the musical sense. The sweetest organ does not appeal to those who have no appreciation of the laws of harmony and melody. It only speaks to those who have a spiritual responsiveness which can interpret its divine meaning. What a treasury of intellectual joys, which infinitely surpass all the pleasures of the senses or the joys which come from material things, is revealed by the opening of the door of thought. No matter how poverty-stricken one's environment may be, no matter what misfortunes, failures, distressing conditions surround an individual, it is possible to rise out of these discords of an inhospitable environment into a heaven of unspeakable joy. Think what the opening of this door means to the world's shut-ins, invalids, cripples, the bedridden, and even the unfortunate prisoners. Through thought the wretched criminal can rise out of his barred cell. As Lovelace, in prison, wrote to Althea, stone walls do not a prison make. Nor iron bars a cage, minds innocent and quiet take, that for an hermitage. A man's intellectual and beauty-creating powers were intended as a means of escape from the most discouraging, distressing surroundings. A man's soul was not intended to be imprisoned, nor can it be weighed down by unfortunate conditions. No failure, no disaster from fire or flood, can keep a human being from rising into a paradise of harmony and beauty where his soul can revel in a world of its own making, equipped, decorated by its own creative imagination, and yet what school or college has ever taught the youth the marvelous possibilities of creating his own ideal world? The study of a flower, of a plant, of a sunset, of a bit of landscape, kindled the flame which fired the aesthetic soul of Ruskin, opened up a new world in the great within of himself, which not only made his own life a joy slash but enabled him to open the door of happiness in a vast multitude of other lives. Once open this door of appreciation in a human soul and no power in heaven or earth can ever close it again nor limit the possibilities in the discovery. Benjamin West said that it was his mother's kiss in appreciation of a little drawing of his that made him a painter. It was this kiss, he said, that opened up a new world to him the world beautiful. I too am a painter, cried Correggio when his eyes first beheld Raphael's Saint Cecilia. Many an artist's soul has been set on fire by looking upon another's masterpiece, which started the conflagration in his aesthetic nature, which was never quenched. Art is unquestionably one of the purest and highest elements in human happiness. It trains the mind through the eye, and the eye through the mind. As the sun colors flowers, so does art color life. Beauty is a refining, elevating, saving force. The love of the beautiful is an indication of superiority, of a superior mentality. It indicates that the possessor has risen out of the basement of life into the upper stories where he has caught a glimpse of his God. All through our youth and even in later life new doors to new joys are constantly being opened up, often by accident, by the suggestion of a friend, by the reading of an inspiring book or by thinking. As George Herbert wrote, more servants wait on man, than he'll take notice of. The pleasures which come from the gratification of the senses, the appetites, and passions, are as dross compared with the joys which are revealed in the wonderful realm of thought. The intellectual joys overtop all others. Whoever has a good mind, well developed, ought never to have a dull or stupid moment. The man of trained mind is largely independent of his environment. If things are disagreeable, if people bore him, if his surroundings are uncongenial, he can lift himself out of it all and retire within the gate of his own mind and revel in the exercise of his intellectual faculties. He can not only retire from the most exasperating conditions, but also, in an instant, be in an ideal world of his imagination. 
the sources of a trained mind are inexhaustible. What luxury, never enjoyed by former monarchs of the earth, does a thinker now find in books? There is no spot on earth so dejecting, poverty-stricken, or distressing that a trained mind can not only summon the grandest characters that live in history, but he can also find them at their best, they will give him their best thoughts, their best moods, and finest philosophy. What are the pleasures of the palate, the pleasures of the senses, the joys that come from material wealth, compared with the riches possible to the trained mind of the poorest creature on earth? As Epictetus says, no power can keep us from enjoyments of the mind, from intellectual enjoyments. The influence which others and conditions have upon us is immensely exaggerated. The fact is that happiness or misery is very largely in our own power. The poorest creature that walks the earth has power to summon into his presence the greatest poets who will sing to him their choicest songs, the greatest historians will reveal the past to him, biographers will repeat the stories of those who have triumphed over want and woe, who have conquered difficulties and won immortal fame. The pursuit of education by a soul hungry for knowledge, yearning for intellectual growth, is the highest kind of pleasure, because it gives infinite satisfaction and infinite advantage. He is the greatest man whose supreme ambition is to make the most of his life, to enrich it by self-education, self-culture, self-development and helpful service, until every fiber of his being becomes responsive to every good and helpful influence in the entire range of his environment. What a joy people who have had the advantages of education and superior opportunities for culture and refinement may find in helping others who have been deprived of these opportunities, and whose souls hunger for the richer, fuller life to gain them. One of the grandest sights in the world is that of an adult seizing every opportunity to make up for the loss of early educational advantages, pouring his very soul into his spare moments and evenings, trying to make himself a larger, fuller, completer man. Opportunities for self-improvement surround us, and in this day of cheap books, free libraries, and evening schools, there can be no good excuse for neglect to use the facilities for mental growth. There is nothing else that will give you greater satisfaction in after years than the forming of such systematic habits of self-culture early in life as to make your self-improvement processes automatic. There never was a time in the history of the world and education was worth so much as today, when knowledge adds so much power, contributes so much to happiness. What a golden opportunity confronts you for coining your bits of leisure into knowledge that will mean growth of character, promotion, advancement, power, riches that no accident can take from you, no disaster annihilate. There is a divine hunger in every normal being for self-expansion a yearning for growth or enlargement. Beware of stifling this craving of nature for self-unfoldment. Man was made for growth, to realize poise of mind, peace, satisfaction. It is the object, the explanation, of his being. To have an ambition to grow larger and broader every day, to push the horizon of one's ignorance a little further away, to become a little richer in knowledge, a little wiser, and more of a man that is an ambition worthwhile. What you can abstract from life, is just a question of how you train your mind and form your habits of thought. It is just a question of your ability to extract beauty, utility, and joy from your environment, which you think is so commonplace, dry, lean, and void of beauty. If you think your life has so little for you, you have not learned the secret of extracting from life its joys, beauties, truth, and loveliness. The soul that loves beauty can feast on it everywhere. There is not a nook or corner in the universe where it does not exist. Think of the marvels which the microscope reveals, or the wonderful mysteries which the telescope brings to us from the depths of the universe to the unaided eye. A great admirer of Agassiz once sent him a check for $1,000 so that he could travel abroad and collect some valuable material and bring home precious truths for his wonderful science. But Agassiz wrote him that he proposed to spend his vacation in his own backyard, 
and his great mind found even their remnants of fossil remains and other discoveries which made valuable additions to science. The mind which could profitably spend days upon the scale of a fish, and hours studying and reading the history of a grain of sand from the seashore, and the history of an ocean pebble, could find material enough in the humblest environment for the profitable study of a lifetime. The possibilities of happiness which we have discovered, and utilized are to the human mind what the little corn patch of the Indians was to the vast wealth, of this great continent. The things we never use because we were never trained to see or enjoy them, would, if utilized, revolutionize our lives. What the most intelligent of us use is as nothing compared to what we lose. No matter which way we look we can see marvels of design, of possible utility and of beauty, which a whole lifetime of study could never exhaust. To watch the corn grow, or the blossom set, to draw hard breath over plowshare or spade, to read, to think, to love, to pray, these, says Ruskin, are the things that make men happy. We should more fully appreciate our opportunities could we realize what a blind person with a love of the beautiful would give just for a glimpse of the marvelous world, which is all shut out from him and free to us. What would he not give if he could just have his eyes open for a few months and be allowed to travel over this beautiful earth and drink in the world's beauties? Just to be able to see the flower, to get one glimpse of the landscape which we see so often that it makes almost no impression upon us, what would it not mean to one of these poor blind creatures? The ability to look into a sea of human faces, to watch the play of thought, sentiment, and mood upon their countenances would afford infinite pleasure and joy to them, and yet, how little we ourselves appreciate this privilege. Luther said that paradise might apply to the whole world and why not? There is not a corner of the universe which the great lover of the beautiful has not decorated with more marvelous beauties than any human being ever decorated anything. In the faraway places where no human being has ever trod, there are beauties of plant life, of flowers, of crystal formation in rocks, beauties of birds and beasts, of landscape, which no human eye hath ever seen, proving that the great author of the universe is a lover of, uncontained immortal beauty. What a pity that every child should not be taught to read God's handwriting in beauty, in everything everywhere. Suppose the greatest human being that ever lived could be endowed with omnipotence, the omniscience, the magic power and the wisdom, to create a world which in every particular would be a paradise, a world which would be absolutely perfect in every respect, to evolve a plant life which would give the greatest possible joy and satisfaction to human beings, create fruits, vegetables and all else which would give the most intense pleasure to the human palate. In other words, Suppose this human being should be endowed with the godlike qualities to create a world, which could satisfy every yearning and every longing of his soul, could he equal the marvelous creations which have already been provided for every human being? There is not a single human desire, not a longing which has not been provided for in this marvelous creation, and why is it that our lives are so very lean, so poverty-stricken, so pinched, so limited, so blighted? when they might be so grand, so magnificent, so sublime. The love of the beautiful is a fundamental quality of the human mind. It first manifests itself in the rude decoration of the savage, and becomes an increasing passion with the progress of civilization. Merely to exist was not the object of man's creation, but to live sublimely, magnificently, to live like a king, not like a mannequin, not like a starved, stunted, burlesque of the real man God intended. To the man who has developed his intellectual and aesthetic faculties there is untold joy in travel. Ruskin saw paradise everywhere he went. Every plant, every flower, every new specimen of vegetable life, every sunset, every bit of landscape, were to him God's hieroglyphics, by which he could learn the mind of the great artist of the beautiful. Suppose a John Ruskin were to travel the world over with one whose brain had been pinched, 
whose intellectual life had been stunted and starved by a monotonous, routine life work. Think of the difference between what these men would derive from such a tour one, a man who sees God's handwriting in every leaf, a divine message in every flower, whose very soul leaps for joy at the sight of every bit of beautiful scenery, whose soul is all aglow in a sunset, who is entranced by everything that God made, and the other, a man whose deadened faculties do not respond to the stimulus of beautiful scenery, or strange lands and peoples, or works of art. Only the brain cells he has used in his narrow occupation have been developed, all of the others lie dormant, went out of business long ago, from the lack of exercise and stimulus. Travel to such a man means very little. Surrounded as we are with the real sources of happiness, costless, limitless, many of us allow our finer senses to atrophy and turn to money as the primary source of happiness. But putting money into the purse is pretty poor sort of business compared with putting beauty into the life, cultivating the sublime, the magnificent in our natures. Cementing precious friendships, cultivating those we love, pushing the horizon of ignorance farther and farther away from us, opening up the intellectual life, enlarging the mind, unfolding the immortal sides of our being, all these afford infinitely greater pleasure than chasing the dollar or titillating the senses. The joy of living, therefore, lies not without us but within us. It is the power to appreciate, to make our own, the intellectual and aesthetic joys that are free to all, which raises us from the multitude, who, owning more than we, are like dumb driven cattle, that walk and sleep and feed but know only the things that minister to the grosser appetites. From the man who has been trained to think, to extract the honey of life from all sorts of sources, the man who has been trained to use his ears, and see things, the mere lack of money can take little away. Circumstances have scant power to rob him if he has a good mind, good health, and all his senses are intact. He can manage to become very rich in his personality, a millionaire mentally, although a pauper in material things. He may be a billionaire in cheerfulness, in usefulness, and in nobility of character. The power of material things, to bestow happiness, to bring joy into the life is tremendously exaggerated. The right mental attitude, the trained mind, will bring to us the best there is in the universe. Chapter 3, Reading Mocketh a Full Man Only three things are necessary to make life happy, the blessing of God, books, and a friend. Signed, La Cordaire. If the crowns of the world were laid at my feet in exchange for my love of reading, would spurn them all. Signed, Fenelon. In a certain village, Sir John Herschel tells us, a blacksmith got hold of Richardson's novel Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded, and used to sit on his anvil in the long summer evenings and read it aloud to a large and attentive audience. It is by no means a short book, but they eagerly listen to it all. At length, when the happy turn of fortune arrived, which brings the hero and heroine together and sets them living long and happily according to the most approved rules, the congregation were so delighted as to raise a great shout, and, procuring the church keys, actually set the parish bells ringing. Good books are lengthening and brightening the lives of a multitude of people. Perhaps nothing else has such power to lift the poor out of his poverty, the wretched out of his misery, to make the burden-bearer forget his burden, the sick his suffering, the sorrowing his grief, the downtrodden his degradation, as books. They are friends to the lonely, companions to the deserted, joy to the joyless, good cheer to the disheartened, a helper to the helpless. They bring light into darkness and sunshine into shadow. How many a wretched one, poor and forsaken perhaps by the world, has found solace in his poverty and a refuge from his want and woe, a pleasant substitute for his gloomy thoughts, as he has delved like a prince in some great book. We hear a great deal about the increased cost of living, 
but never in history could poor people get so much of the life essentials, and even the things that were luxuries a short time ago, for so little money, as today. The products of the greatest minds that have ever lived, were never so cheap. Copies of the great masterpieces of literature, which a century ago were only within the reach of the rich, are now often found in the poorest homes. The printing press has brought the greatest literary wealth within the reach of the poorest people. How many men and women there are, who think their lives have been failures, who feel dejected, lonely, and shut out from society, and pity themselves because they have not been able to see the world, or mix with people who have done things worthwhile. Little do these realize that they have right in their own homes, or can easily obtain for a small sum of money, the most precious, the richest sort of friends, guests who would have been more than welcome in the palaces of princes. Why mourn because your poverty, your lack of chance in life, cuts you off from the society of those who have been more fortunate, when without the exertion of changing your clothing for a social function, you can spend the evening with the kings and queens of the earth, the greatest characters, can without embarrassment or timidity hold communion with the greatest minds that have ever lived. The purest pleasures I have ever known, says Richard Cobden, are those accessible to you all, it is in the calm intercourse with intelligent minds, and, in the communion with the departed great, through books, by our own firesides. Isolation, separation from others, whether it be caused by physical weakness or by an unfortunate disposition or unsocial nature, is one of the greatest sources of unhappiness but through books one need not be alone but can live intimately with the greatest personalities the world has known. Books are delightful society, said Gladstone, if you go into a room and find it full of books, even without taking them from their shelves they seem to speak to you, to bid you welcome. They seem to tell you that they have got something inside their covers that will be good for you, and that they are willing and desirous to impart to you. It is said that Bunyan during the years he was in jail, became so absorbed in some of the characters in Pilgrim's Progress, and was so carried away with them, that he would often fall upon his knees and shed tears of joy in his ecstasies. His imagination transformed his prison into a palace beautiful. The jail walls did not confine his mind or his imagination. He lived in the town of Vanity Fair, he climbed the delectable mountain. Stone walls do not a prison make for such a spirit of happiness as Bunyan possessed. Think of this wonderful man imprisoned for twelve years, and yet, in spite of all he suffered, producing a book only second to the Bible. I have friends, said Petrarch, whose society is extremely agreeable to me, they are of all ages and of every country. They have distinguished themselves both in the cabinet and in the field, and obtained high honors for their knowledge of the sciences. It is easy to gain access to them, for they are always at my service, and I admit them to my company and dismiss them from it whenever I please. They are never troublesome, but immediately answer every question I ask them. Some teach me how to live, and others how to die. Some by their vivacity drive away my cares and exhilarate my spirits, while others give fortitude to my mind and teach me the important lesson, how to restrain my desires and depend wholly on myself. They open to me, in short, the various avenues of all the arts and sciences, and upon their information I may safely rely in all emergencies. In return for all their services they only ask me to accommodate them with a convenient chamber in some corner of my humble habitation where they may repose in peace, for these friends are more delighted by the tranquility of retirement than with the tumults of society. Many of our choicest friends live between the leaves of our favorite books. We become more intimate with them than with any living characters. We are not afraid to open our hearts to one of them without reserve. There need be no clash of opinion. Our communion is heart to heart. People are often ashamed to be seen with some persons with whom they desire to associate, and they are often secretive about some of their friendships, 
but they are frank in choosing friends in books. Hence, the voluntary selection of book companions is very important and we can quickly estimate a man's character by his choice. They indicate the degree of his culture, his good taste and refinement or his coarseness and vulgarity. The books we collect are confessions of what we like and of what we are. Many people make reading a means of intellectual dissipation. They do not read to learn, or to improve themselves, but merely to kill time, and for amusement. Reading, without some sort of a purpose, is demoralizing. We read for recreation, but thoughtless reading without any purpose, except that of a means of intellectual dissipation, is always demoralizing. It brings on a form of ennui, and makes one restless and discontented instead of happy and contented. To read profitably one must keep these three things in mind, intention, attention, and retention. It is worth noting that the word retention comes from the Latin retses, a net. Nets are made so that the smaller and worthless fishes may slip through the meshes. So the mind trained to retention allows trivial things to escape and holds in memory only things of greater importance. To read constantly for the sake of something to think of is to stultify oneself. Bacon said, reading mocketh a full man. But there are different sorts of fullness, and that of the idle glutton is not to be commended. Let the dissipated reader ponder the wise words of Milton. Who reads incessantly, and to his reading brings not, a spirit and judgment equal or superior. Uncertain and unsettled still remains, deep versed in books, and shallow in himself. If you are anxious to improve yourself, read books which tend to elevate your taste, refine your imagination, clarify your ambition, raise your ideals. Read books of power, books which stir the very depths of your being to some purpose. Read books which make you resolve to do and be a little better, to try a little harder to be somebody and to do something in the world. Fifteen minutes concentrated reading every day would carry one through the great authors in about five years. Newell Dwight Hillis says, one barrier that has helped to hold back the happiness that ought to sweep over our land like an advancing flood is found in modern literature. Man's mental mood must needs reflect the books and philosophy he reads. If former generations were happy in their garrets it was because their favorite authors were optimists, who saw life's good, indeed, yet also saw that evil, in its heart, was also good. The great authors, from Homer and Paul down to Shakespeare, have been the children of exultant joy as well as genius, all were large-natured, sweet, wholesome, healthy, and happy. In his book, The Pleasures of Life, Sir John Lubbock gives a list of carefully chosen books, which so whet the mental appetite, says a writer, that one wishes immediately to abandon even the glories of the earth the companionship of delightful living friends, the excitements of travel, the pursuits of engaging avocations, to get to a quiet corner and for the time live in them. Books make it possible for every person born into the world to begin where the previous generation left off. Every person born finds everything brought up to date for him. The author seems to say to the newcomer into the world, I present to you in this volume the investigation of my lifetime in science, in literature, in art. One gives the results of a lifetime study of bird life. Another brings his lifetime study of insects, another of animals, another his travels, and so on. For a few pennies a newcomer on the earth may reap the fruit in art or books of a whole lifetime. Instead of going over the ground himself, he finds that multitudes have been gathering for him the results of their life's endeavor in their special line. For a small sum we purchase what may have cost fortunes, untold sacrifices, and struggles with poverty and hardship. A great help in obtaining the knowledge which sinks in, springs up, and bears efficient fruit, comes from owning good books. 
Much of the wisdom which people possess probably comes from things which they read and reread many times in their school books. The sense of hurry engendered by the knowledge that a book must be returned to the public library at a certain time is extremely detrimental, if not fatal, to that absorption of its meaning from which alone can come power or restful pleasure. Therefore, have a library of your own. It does not need to be a large library. Nearly all America's greatest men and women read but few books when young, but these few they read so exhaustively, and digested so thoroughly, that their spirit, purpose, and principles became a part of the reader's very souls, the dynamos which moved their lives to great ends. The reading of good fiction is a splendid imagination exerciser and builder. It stimulates it by suggestions, powerfully increases its picturing capacity, and keeps it fresh and vigorous and wholesome, and a wholesome imagination plays a very great part in every sane and worthy life. Aside from reading fiction, books of travel are of the best for mental diversion, then there are nature studies, and science and poetry, all affording wholesome recreation, all of an uplifting character, and some of them opening up study specialties of the highest order, as in the great range of books classified as natural science. The reading and study of poetry is much like the interest one takes in the beauties of natural scenery. Much of the best poetry is indeed a poetic interpretation of nature. Whittier and Longfellow and Bryant lead their readers to look on nature with new eyes, as Ruskin opened the eyes of Henry Ward Beecher. Among books, the writings of the poets have perhaps furnished the greatest inspiration to the human mind. Poetry has been defined as the highest expression of the highest thought. Poetry, says Shelley, awakens and enlarges the mind itself by rendering it the receptacle of a thousand unapprehended combinations of thought. Poetry lifts the veil from the hidden beauty of the world, and makes familiar objects be as if they were not familiar. Nor must the philosophers be overlooked. The readers who do not know the Concord philosopher, Emerson, and the great writers of antiquity, Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, and Plato, have pleasures to come. When I consider what some books have done for the world, and what they are doing, how they keep up our hope, awaken new courage and faith, soothe pain, give an ideal of life to those whose homes are hard and cold, bind together distant ages and foreign lands, create new worlds of beauty, bring down truths from heaven, I give eternal blessings for this gift, says an appreciative reader. How books extend our mental horizon and broaden our limitation. Through them the centuries give up their choicest treasure to us. The wisdom of the greatest minds that have ever lived, is ours for the asking. No matter how poor, or how circumscribed our condition may be, books can quickly take us out of our close environment into any country or people. All the nations lay their best at our feet, and for a mere trifle. No entertainment is so cheap as reading, nor any pleasure so lasting. Good books elevate the character, purify the taste, take the attractiveness out of low pleasures, and lift us upon a higher plane of thinking and living. Carlyle said that a collection of books is a university. What a pity that the thousands of ambitious, energetic men and women who missed their opportunities for an education at the school age, and feel crippled by their loss, fail to catch the significance of this, fail to realize the tremendous cumulative possibilities of that great life improver, that admirable substitute for a college or university education reading. The following story shows how easily, with a little self-denial, one may collect a library. How can you afford all these books? Asked a young man, calling upon a friend, I can't seem to find spare change for even the leading magazines. Oh, that library is only my one cigar a day, was the reply. What do you mean? Inquired the visitor. Mean? Just this, when you advised me to indulge in an occasional cigar, several years ago, 
I had been reading about a young fellow who bought books with money that others would have burned in cigars, and I thought I would try to do the same. You may remember that I said I should allow myself one cigar a day? Yes, I recall the conversation, but don't quite see the connection. Well, I never smoked, but I put by the price of a five-cent cigar every day and, as the money accumulated, I bought books, the very books you see. You don't mean to say that your books cost no more than that. Why, there are dollars worth of them. Yes, I know there are. I had six years more of my apprenticeship to serve when you advised me to be a man. I put by the money, which, at five cents a day, amounted to $18 a year, or $109 in six years. I keep those books by themselves, as a result of my apprenticeship cigar money, and, if you'd done as I did, you would by this time have saved many, many more dollars than I have, and would have been better off in health and own a library besides. Surround yourself with good books. There is something in the very atmosphere of books which is helpful and inspiring. One seems to absorb culture from the presence of books and contact with them. The mind changes, our ideals enlarge, when we are surrounded by good books. One can learn to love books, and derive much pleasure from them, too, by constantly being in their presence, and getting acquainted with them. An unread man, says Richard Le Gallienne, has only to read a very few of the great representative novels to find where he stands, what his tastes are likely to be, and what it is that he is looking for in books. A living library is not to be deliberately made. You cannot plan it out on paper and then buy it en bloc. Of course you can make a collection of books in that way, but a collection of books is not a library. A bookstore is a collection of books, but it is not a library. A library is an organism developing side by side with the mind and character of its owner. It is the house of his spirit and is thus furnished progressively in accordance with the progress of his mental life. Cicero described a home without books as a body without a soul. Although Macaulay had most everything that wealth, rank, and genius could give, yet he always preferred the company of his books to that of the greatest men and women of his time. Gibbon declared that he would not exchange his love of reading for all the treasures of India. Books are both our luxuries and our daily bread. They have become to our lives and happiness prime necessities. They are our trusted favorites, our guardians, our confidential advisors, and the safe consumers of our leisure. They cheer us in poverty, and comfort us in the misery of affluence. It is of immense importance to teach children to avoid unpleasant, disagreeable, soul-harrowing books. Keep them from reading morbid stories, morbid descriptions of crime and misery in the newspapers. Do not let these black pictures etch their hideous forms into their tender, sensitive minds. Many people who have lived troubled lives have regarded their love for books, their library, as their most precious possession their heaven upon earth. In their books they find solace, comfort, peace of mind, which passeth all understanding. Whenever things go wrong with us and we are weary of life, when everything seems to bore us, when we are too tired and too distressed and too weary to work, we can call to our side the greatest writers that have ever lived and find rest and refreshment. The humblest citizen can summon Shakespeare or Emerson to his hovel, and he will give him his best. Oliver Goldsmith once said, The first time I read an interesting book, it is to me just as if I had gained a new friend, when I read over a book I have perused before, it resembles the meeting with an old one. It might be truly said that those who have no friendship for books can live only a half-life. One who has but 100 choice books in his library has 100 doors each of which opens on prospects of infinite joy. Chapter 4 the alchemy of a cheerful mind. A real power of life lies in smiles. 
Smiles are the only potentials known that move things whether they intend to move or not. What is an optimist? Asked a farmer's boy. Well, John, replied his father, you know I can't give ye the dictionary mayonine of that word any more and I can of a great many others. But I've got a kind of an e-day what it means. Probably you don't remember your Uncle Henry, but I guess if there ever was an optimist, he was one. Things was always coming out right with Henry, and especially anything hard that he had to do, it wasn't a goin' to be hard, twas just sort of solid pleasant. Take hoe and corn, now. If anything ever tuckered me out, twas hoe and corn in the hot sun. But in the field, long about the time I begun to lag back a little, Henry he'd look up and say. Good, Jim. When we get these two rows hoed, and eighteen more, the piece'll be half done. And he'd say it in such a kind of a cheerful way that I couldn't have been any more tickled if the piece had been all done, and the rest would go light enough. But the worst thing we had to do hoen, corn was a picnic to it was pickin' stones. There was no end to that on our old farm, if we wanted to raise anything. When we wa'n't hurried and pressed with something else, there was always pickin' stones to do in there wa'n't a plowin', but what brought up a fresh crop, and seems as if the pickin' had all to be done over again. Well, you'd a thought, to hear Henry, that there wa'n't any fun in the world like pickin' stones. He looked at it in a different way from anybody I ever see. Once, when the corn was all hoed, and the grass wa'n't fit to cut yet, and I'd got all laid out to go fishin', and father he up and set us to pickin' stones up on the west piece, and I was about ready to cry, Henry he says. Come on, Jim. I know where there's lots of nuggets. And what do you espose, now? That boy had a kind of a game that that their field was what he called a placer mining field, and he got me into it, and I could have sworn I was in California all day, we had such a good time. Only, says Henry, after we'd got through the day's work, the way you get rich with these nuggets is to get rid of em, instead of keepin' em. That somehow didn't strike my fancy, but we'd had play instead of work, anyway, and a great lot of stones had been rooted out of that field. And, as I said before, I can't give ye any dictionary definition of optimism, but if your Uncle Henry wa'n't an optimist, I don't know what one is. An optimistic mind is a sort of a prism which brings the rainbow colors out of things which are invisible to the pessimist. The prism does not make the colors in the spectrum. They are everywhere in the light before our eyes. Our light is made up of all the different colors of the rainbow. The prism merely separates them and makes them visible to the eye. Every man should have an optimistic lens which can distinguish the uncommon in the common, which can detect all the beauties there are in his environment. It is wicked to go about among one's fellow men with a face which indicates that life has been a disappointment to you instead of a glorious joy. What a pitiable thing to see people go through life peddling vinegar, radiating bitterness, finding fault, and seeing only the ugly, worrying, fretting, cynical, and pessimistic. Some people have a genius for seeing only the crooked, the evil, and disagreeable. Pessimism is always a destroyer, never a producer. We need more joy peddlers, and sunshine makers, more people who refuse to see the ugly, the bitter, and the crooked, who see the world of beauty and perfection which God has made, and not the world which sin and discord and disease have made. We need people who see the man and woman whom God has made, pure, clean, sane, healthy, and not the ugly, diseased, discordant dwarf, the burlesque of man, which wrong thinking, wrong living, and sin have made. Oh, what riches live in a sunny soul! Take joy with you, cling to her, no matter where you go or what you do. It is your lubricating oil which would prevent the jars, the discords, and shut out the sorrows of life. What a heritage is a smiling face, 
to be able to fling out sunshine everywhere one goes, to scatter the shadows and to lighten sorrowing hearts, to have the power to send cheer into despairing souls through a sunny and radiant disposition. The ability to radiate sunshine is a greater power than beauty or wealth. If you would do the maximum of which you are capable, keep the mind filled with sunshine, with beauty and truth, with cheerful, uplifting thoughts. Bury everything that makes you unhappy and discordant, everything that cramps your freedom, that worries you, before it buries you. Probably many readers of this book have heard of Smiling Joe, the optimistic little cripple at the Sea Breeze home on Long Island. He was kept strapped to a board during four years of his life on account of severe spinal trouble. Yet he was the happiest child in the hospital, and, in spite of being strapped to his cruel board all these years, radiated more sunshine than anybody else in the home. The test of character is one's ability to remain cheerful, serene, hopeful, even under fire. It is easy to be bright and optimistic when one enjoys robust health and is prosperous, but it requires heroic qualities to be so when poor health mocks ambition, and we are surrounded by disheartening conditions. We want cheerful men and women, with more hopefulness and laughter. We have enough long and sour faces, enough of chilling looks and exclusive manners. Cheerfulness is one of the great miracle workers of the world. It reinforces the whole man, doubles and trebles his power and gives a new meaning to life. No man has failed until he has lost his cheerfulness, his optimistic outlook upon life. Give me the man who, like Emerson, believes there is a remedy for every wrong, a satisfaction for every longing soul, the man who believes the best of everybody, and who sees beauty and loveliness where others see ugliness and disgust. Give me the man who believes that there is a great, underlying, beneficent principle running through the world, a current running heavenward, who believes that there is a great beneficent cause which brings things out infinitely better than we can plan them ourselves, who does not try to regulate the universe, but simply trusts this great divine principle. Give me the man who believes in the ultimate triumph of truth over error, of harmony over discord, of love over hate, of purity over vice, of light over darkness, of life over death. Such men are the true nation builders. The man who has learned to surround himself with an atmosphere of peace and harmony, no matter what discord and darkness are in his environment, is the man who has learned the last lesson of culture. And, after all, this peace and serenity must come by controlling the thought and by knowing that only the real, the good, is true, because God made it, and that everything else is false because he did not make it. When we learn that discord, disease, and all that worries and frets and makes us anxious are only the absence of harmony, and that they are not realities of being, that God never made them, and hence they must be false, then we shall learn the secret of real harmonious living, we shall learn the secret of scientific living. Then we can throw the best of ourselves into the most unfortunate environment, we can fling out the fragrance and beauty of serene and balanced lives, even in the most discordant surroundings. Think the good, drive away evil, keep the mind so filled with the good, the beautiful and the true, that the opposites will find no affinity there. If there is no music in me, no affinity for justice, for the good, the beautiful and the true, then I may not appreciate them in my life. If there is no Emerson in me, then his works will not find a response in my soul. If there is no love of the beautiful in my soul, then I shall meet no beauty anywhere in the world. When we learn that there is enough divinity in us to conquer all the inharmony, to swallow all the discord that would mar the great divine symphony, then we shall be living to some purpose. This knowledge is the magic which will transform the hovel into a palace. Deacon Brown was always noted for expressing his gratitude in the prayer meetings, for some special blessing, even though all sorts of misfortunes and hard luck had followed him all his life, and he had lost everything he had ever had, every member of his family, his home, his property, 
his health. His friends wondered what he could find to be grateful for. He seemed just as cheerful and optimistic as ever. Val, he said, even if I've lost everything in the world, I'm still thanking the Lord I've two teeth left and one opposite t'other. A man traveling in the west on a crowded train sat in the seat with an old lady, who every little while would take a bottle from her satchel, hold it out of the window and shake something out of it which looked like salt. The man finally asked her what she was doing this for. Oh, she said, these are flower seeds. I have made it a rule for many years when traveling to scatter seeds by the railroad tracks, especially in crossing the desert and in unattractive parts of the country. Do you see those beautiful flowers beside the track? Well, they came from seeds which I scattered along this same road many years ago. Hopefulness, laughter, and cheer. Someone writes. Scatter them wherever you go like roses on your path. Give them in place of grudges and throw them out instead of hints. Exchange them for insinuations and substitute them for complaints. Take them to your shopmates in the morning and bring them back to your loved ones at noon. Bestow them in the office and send them in the mail. Carry them to the sick and leave them with the unconsoled. Everywhere and always, with your Christian geniality, warm up the cold streets and hearthstones of the world. Cheerfulness amid dark and gloomy surroundings is like the glow of sunlight irradiating the murkiness of the day. The influence of a cheerful spirit cannot be estimated. It takes only a drop of oil to stop a screeching axle or hinge. So a little bit of sunshine scatters the shadows. Sunlight has an inspiriting effect, a beneficent influence, it is favorable to health, it makes all nature rejoice, and it warms the soul of man. So a cheerful face lightens other hearts, gives strength to other lives, and imparts courage to face difficulties that may frown before one. Someone has said, a happy human face it is the gift that may be made by poor or rich, by old or young. It is the gift to which all are entitled, with which all are pleased. It is written in a language all can read, and carries a message none can refuse. I just like to let her in at the door, said an Irish servant of a lady caller. The very face of her does one good, sure. How glad we all are to welcome sunny souls. We are never too busy to see them. There is nothing we welcome so much as sunshine. The cheerful heart makes its own blue sky. We all know how the very landscape seems to laugh with us when we rejoice, seems to exult with us when we are glad, and the very sun and the flowers seem to reflect our joy. But when we are melancholy in blue all nature takes on the same expression, and while, of course, there is no real change in nature, yet to us this apparent change is tremendous. When we lose the power to smile, what hideous images arise in the mind. How soon the imagination becomes morbid. The mind becomes infested with doubts and fears, and hallucinations when its activity ceases. When the purpose is gone, disorder comes in, when joy goes out, melancholia enters. If there is anything we need in this too serious civilization of ours, it is men and women who smile always. It costs no more to wear a smile than to go about with a thunder, cloud expression, and what a difference it will make to you and everybody who sees you. Everybody we meet is helped or hindered by what we radiate. It makes all the difference in the world whether we go about with a smiling face or wearing a frown. A smile in the heart not only changes the expression but it changes the whole nature which, as we know, takes on the color of our moods. The time has gone by when long-faced, too sober, too serious people shall dominate the world. Melancholy solemnity used to be regarded as a sign of spirituality, but it is now looked upon as the imprint of a morbid mind. There is no religion in it. True religion is full of hope, sunshine, optimism, 
and cheerfulness. It is joyous and glad and beautiful. There is no Christianity in the ugly, the discordant, the sad. The religion which Christ taught was bright, cheerful, and beautiful. The sunshine, the lilies of the field, the birds of the air, the hills, the valleys, the trees, the mountains, the brooks, all things beautiful, were in his teaching. There was no cold, dry theology in it. It was just happy Christianity. Refuse to be gloomy. Cheer up. Get your mind off your troubles. Do not think about them. Think of the bright things in life. Think gratefully of the good things you have, and be cheerful. Emerson says. Do not hang a dismal picture on your wall, and do not deal with sables and glooms in your conversation. If you carry about a gloomy face, you advertise the fact that hope has died out of you, that life has been a disappointment to you. Adopt the sundial's motto, I record none but hours of sunshine. What else in life is more valuable than the art of forgetting, of burying, covering up the disagreeable, everything that has caused us pain and hindered our progress? The person who has this art is largely independent of his immediate surroundings. He can be happy without money. He can be happy in good times or in hard times. He can rejoice when others are mourning, have a good time when others are in the blues. Man was not made to express discord, but harmony, to express beauty, truth, love, and happiness, wholeness, not halfness, completeness, not incompleteness. The mental temple was not given us for the storing of things that distress us. It was intended for the abode of the gods, for the treasuring of high purposes, grand aims, noble aspirations. It does not take very long to learn that the good excludes the bad, that the higher always shuts out the lower, that the greater motive, the grander affection, excludes the lesser, the lower. The good is more than a match for the bad. Above all else, I love a courageous gaiety, one that can accomplish great deeds with smiles and song, that gaiety of the soldier who makes the best of everything, seasons his thin porridge with a joke, laughs over his primitive bed, the inclemency of the seasons, and hums the tunes of his native country while firing his gun. What a marvelous gift to have that mental alchemy which makes even poverty seem attractive, which sees the ludicrous side of misfortune. I once traveled with a young man who had a marvelous alchemy in his nature which turned the most disagreeable experiences into gold. He could find enjoyment in the most ordinary and even the most embarrassing situations. He had a genius for seeing the funny side of things, and kept everybody around him laughing. Once when we were so troubled with fleas in a hotel in Vienna that we could not sleep, I saw my friend on the floor having a lot of fun, measuring a large specimen. He said that he had found the biggest flea on record. There is everything in acquiring the art of looking on the sunny side of men and things. The world is a looking glass which flings back to us the reflection of ourselves. If we laugh it laughs back at us. If we shed tears, it reflects a sorrowful face. Do you go through life wretched, miserable, or do you rise above the petty annoyances which destroy the peace of so many people? Learn the fine art of enjoying everybody and everything. Like the bee, get honey from everywhere. Form the habit of getting good out of every experience in life. You can get something which will enrich your life, something helpful, out of everybody you meet. Every experience has something which would help somebody. Why not you? A businesswoman thus tells of an interesting experiment she made, I started out to my work one morning, determined to try the power of cheerful thinking. I had been moody, sullen, and discouraged long enough. I said to myself, T have often observed that a happy state of mind has a wonderful effect upon my physical makeup, so I will try its effect upon others, and see if my right thinking can be brought to act upon them. You see I was curious. 
As I walked along, more and more resolved on my purpose, and persisting that I was happy, that the world was treating me well, I was surprised to find myself lifted up, as it were, my carriage became more erect, my step lighter, and I had the sensation of treading on air. Unconsciously, I was smiling, for I caught myself in the act once or twice. I looked into the faces of the women I passed and there saw so much trouble and anxiety, discontent, even to peevishness, that my heart went out to them, and I wished I could impart to them a wee bit of the sunshine I felt pervading me. Arriving at the office, I greeted the bookkeeper with some passing remark, that for the life of me I could not have made under different conditions, I am not naturally witty, it immediately put us on a pleasant footing for the day, she had caught the reflection. The president of the company, by whom I was employed, was a very busy man and much worried over his affairs, and at some remark that he made about my work I would ordinarily have felt quite hurt, being too sensitive by nature and education, but this day I had determined nothing should mar its brightness, so replied to him cheerfully. His brow cleared, and there was another pleasant footing established, and so throughout the day I went, allowing no cloud to spoil its beauty for me or others about me. At the kind home where I was staying the same course was pursued, and, where before I had felt estrangement and want of sympathy, I found congeniality and warm friendship. People will meet you halfway if you will take the trouble to go that far. So, my sisters, if you think the world is not treating you kindly, don't delay a day, but say to yourselves, T am going to keep young in spite of the gray hairs, even if things do not always come my way I am going to live for others, and shed sunshine across the pathway of all I meet. You will find happiness springing up like flowers around you, will never want for friends or companionship, and above all the peace of God will rest upon your soul. Some people have a faculty for touching the wrong keys, from the finest instrument they extract only discord. They sound the note of pessimism everywhere. All their songs are in a minor key. Everything is looking down. The shadows predominate in all their pictures. There is nothing bright, cheerful, or beautiful about them. Their outlook is always gloomy, times are always hard and money tight. Everything in them seems to be contracting, nothing expanding or growing or widening in their lives. With others it is just the reverse. They cast no shadows. They radiate sunshine. Every bud they touch opens its petals and flings out its fragrance and beauty. They never approach you but to cheer, they never speak to you but to inspire. They scatter flowers wherever they go. They have that happy alchemy which turns prose to poetry, ugliness to beauty, discord to melody. They see the best in people and say pleasant and helpful things about them. There is no habit which will give more satisfaction, that will enrich you more than this of doing a good turn for others at every opportunity. If you cannot give material help, if you have no money to give, you can always help by a cheerful spirit, by cordial words of sympathy, kindness, and encouragement. There are more hearts hungering for love and sympathy and cheer than for money, and these you can always give. Chapter 5, The Twin Enemies of Happiness, Fear and Worry I wrote down my troubles every day, and after a few short years. When I turned to the heartaches passed away, I read them with smiles, not tears. Worry is the most popular form of suicide. The gods we worship write their names in our faces. Once upon a time a magician felt such pity for a mouse in his house which lived in perpetual fear of the cat, that he changed it into a cat. But it at once began to be afraid of the dog, and the magician changed it into a dog. It still suffered constant terror of a tiger on the premises, and the magician turned it into a tiger. Nor did its troubles end there, for it was in constant fear of a huntsman. 
Finally the disgusted magician turned it back to a mouse again, saying, as you have only the nerve of a mouse, it is impossible to help you by giving you the body of a nobler animal. Many people never seem to be able to rid their minds of fear. When they are poor they imagine that if they only had money and health they would never feel dread or worry again. They imagine that if they had this or that, if they were differently environed or conditioned, they could get rid of anxiety and its whole vampire family, but when they gain these prizes, the same old enemy, although in a different form, still pursues them. There are no more enemies of happiness than fear and worry. They are always and everywhere a curse. There is nothing which we are called upon to meet in life, there is no misfortune or disaster that can ever come to us which we cannot bear better without these joy killers. Fear is an old, old enemy, indeed, and worry its hated accomplice. Primitive fear we have always had with us, but worry is the disease of our own age. In our, enlightenment, we both pity and ridicule the barbarous man who lived in mortal fear of his cruel gods. But have we not also our exacting demons before which our souls cringe and our powers wither and fail? I know a most estimable man who has been terribly handicapped all his life by fear. It has played great havoc with his career. He has fought desperately against it, but he did not know until recently that it was possible to neutralize it by its opposite mental suggestion. He says that fear has dogged his steps from infancy, has strangled his self-expression, has stood in the way of everything he has ever attempted. It has kept him from undertaking things which he was perfectly confident he could carry out. Since he has found out how to neutralize this great destroyer of his peace, his happiness, and his success, his whole mental attitude has completely changed. He says he never discovered himself, or dreamed of his possibilities, until he annihilated fear. The very elimination of this enemy has resulted in a tremendous uplift and improvement, so that where he was once weak, timid, vacillating, fearing to undertake things, he is now strong, vigorous, confident. The destruction of fear has unlocked his latent energy and resulted in a tremendous increase of mental power. He can accomplish more now in a month, and easily, than he could have accomplished formerly in a year, and that with very painful effort. Fear kills hope, worry and anxiety crush confidence, ruin the power to concentrate, and paralyze the initiative. Fear is the fatal foe of all achievement. It is the poisoner of happiness. Take an antitoxin against fret and worry the moment you feel the approach of their contagious atmosphere, says a writer. Many people are always afraid of something. They do not have courage enough really to enjoy life. They are afraid to mingle with those who are mentally their superiors or who have been more favored by fortune. Fearful that their poverty of mind or purse may be disclosed, they thus forfeit many advantages and pleasures to be derived from social discourse. They are cowards, and cowards are never happy. We were made to dominate our environment. It was not intended that we should be buffeted about by accident or chance. Our greatest enemies live in our own brains, in our imaginations, in our wrong ideas of life. We were intended to be conquerors instead of slaves and there is no slavery like the slavery to a conviction or a superstition that makes us cowards. Foolish superstitions and ignorance mar the happiness of a multitude of people. Many think that superstitions are harmless, but nothing is harmless which makes a man believe that he is a puppet of circumstances, that he is at the mercy of signs and symbols, that there is a power in the world in opposition to the omnipotent, something that is working against and trying to harm mortal beings. It is estimated that there are more than 5,000 different forms of fear. With a multitude of people a dread of some impending evil is ever-present. It haunts them even in their happiest moments. Their joy is poisoned with it so that they never take real pleasure or comfort in anything. 
The skeleton in the closet is the ghost that is ever at the banquet. The fear of disease mars the happiness of a vast multitude of people. They picture the horrible symptoms of some dread malady they are sure is developing in their system, and the constant fear impairs nutrition, weakens the resisting power of the body and tends to encourage or develop any possible hereditary taint or disease tendency which may be lurking in the system. Fear modifies all the currents of the blood, poisons and dilutes all the secretions. It strangles the circulation, paralyzes the nervous system, whitens the hair, wrinkles the face, enfeebles the step. What depresses and distresses, disturbs or worries us, in fact, all phases of fear and anxiety, contract the blood vessels and impede the free circulation of the blood. On the other hand whatever makes us happy, whatever excites an enjoyable emotion, relaxes the capillaries and gives freedom to the circulation. Children who live in a fear atmosphere suffer from arrested development, they never unfold naturally, their starved, stunted bodies never become normal, their blood vessels are smaller, their circulation slower, heart weaker, under the influence of these terror-producing demons. Fear dries up the very source of life, while love that casteth out fear has just the opposite effect. It is a strange thing that after all the centuries of experience and enlightenment, the human race has not learned that fear is nothing but a ghost of the imagination, and has not resolved positively to refuse to be tortured by these enemies of happiness. It seems as though the race could have found some way out of this needless suffering centuries ago, but we are still frightened by the same ghosts of fear and worry that haunted our ancestors. They could be easily destroyed or neutralized by simply reversing the thought, the mental attitude. Look back upon your life, you who are nearly at the end, and you will find that the fear of things that made you prematurely old, which wrinkled your face and took the elasticity out of your step, the bloom from your cheek, and robbed you of your joy, was of things which never really happened. It is strange that that which has no basis in reality should have tortured the whole human race from the very dawn of history to the present, as has fear, which has absolutely no reality, but is purely a mental product, a bogey of the imagination. We know that the Creator never put into His image anything which would cause such distress and destroy peace of mind and happiness, which would ruin man's efficiency. A physician has recently said that fear was as normal to the human mind as courage. You might as well say that discord is harmony as to say that fear is normal. Theology and our creeds have too much anxiety and fear, too much shadow, and too little joys and gladness, too much cloud and too little of the sunshine, too much of the hereafter and too little of the now and here. It is, the Christ and not the creed, that humanity wants. For many centuries the Church taught such a wrong and totally false idea of death that it helped to develop a race horror of it. Death is as natural as birth. It is merely passing through another door on the life path, only entering another state of consciousness. The death change is as natural as the change of the caterpillar to the chrysalis, the grub to the butterfly. It is merely one more stage of unfoldment. Death is but a covered bridge, that leads from light to light. Many people have developed such a fear of death, they are so terrified at the very thought of it, that they do not half enjoy the present life or get the most out of it. Some people always seem to be preparing for death. This mental attitude that, not knowing what may happen, we should be prepared for the end when it comes, this living in the shadow of death, is demoralizing. It is a skeleton that rises up to trouble many at their feasts. They cannot really enjoy themselves because of the perpetual death fear. I know several men who, since they passed middle life, have been constantly preparing for the end, getting their affairs in order, making their wills, deciding how their business is to be managed after they are gone. And they are constantly referring to death, talking about it, holding the death picture in the minds, 
of their families like a perpetual moving picture show. Think of what a wrong thing it is for children to be brought up in such a death, picture atmosphere that they are afraid to go to bed at night. I believe that the picture suggested to the child's mind in the prayer, if I should die before I wake, has done infinite harm. What does the child know about death? He cannot comprehend what to him seems the horror, the awfulness of it. I believe the death picture instilled into the young mind during its plastic years, when its imagination is so active, by the parents and the church has been responsible for a vast amount of suffering and has tended to prejudice a vast multitude of people against their creator. There is something so absolutely incompatible between the father-mother idea of the love of God, which we try to instill into our children, and the horrible idea of death, which the child is taught to believe is caused by the same loving God. The two things do not go together, and the child cannot possibly have that sweet, tender love for the being who is responsible for such a revolting death that he should have for an all-loving father. For centuries multitudes of church people lived under sentence of death with an uncertain reprieve. They never seemed to know what moment they would be called. They lived in a constant fear of dying. This constant death horror hung over their lives like a great black pall, shutting off joy. The great soul, calm in the nobler happiness, feels a sense of safety, of absolute security under all circumstances. When one believes that he is the victim of a destiny which he cannot control, that he is liable at any moment to have his life plans upset, his program spoiled, all his hopes frustrated without warning, in other words, that there is no certainty for the future of his endeavor, however great, he cannot develop that solidity of character, that enduring, underlying principle, which is the backbone of every great life. There must be a conviction that there is a divine something within us, which sustains under all circumstances, that a wise creator has placed us beyond the reach of accident upon land or sea, before we can develop an enduring character. There must be a feeling of absolute security, before we can attain that symmetry or arrive at that perfect balance or poise of character which constitutes real manhood and womanhood. As long as there is any doubt in our minds whether we are part of the eternal principle, of the great infinite plan, which cannot be annihilated, but is beyond the reach of want, chance, or misfortune, the character will be defective. It will lack that enduring strength which is characteristic of all great lives. All noble characters have had this unshakable faith in the truth of being, in the one enduring principle, in the reality of love, and the supreme purpose of life. This beautiful confidence in God, who is life not death, was expressed by Whittier in the lines, and so beside the silent sea, I wait with muffled oar, no harm from him can come to me, on ocean or on shore. Fear is the consciousness of separateness from the great, infinite principle of love, of truth, and of omnipotent power. Could anything be more assuring, anything show us better our unity with the divine, than this comforting statement, Lo! I am with you always. It seems as though the psalmist and many of the other Bible writers took special pains to give specific remedies for all human ills. All fear is based upon the fact that the sufferer feels weak from the consciousness of his separateness from the infinite strength, the infinite supply, and when he comes into consciousness of at one meant with the power which made and sustains him, when he finds the peace which satisfies and possesseth all understanding, then will he feel a sense of the glory of being, and, having once touched this power and tasted the infinite blessedness, he will never fear or worry again, never again be satisfied with the flesh pots of Egypt. Our sense of fear is always in proportion to our sense of weakness or inability to protect ourselves from the cause of it. The late Professor Shaler, of Harvard University, said that the greatest discovery of the last century was that of the unity of everything in the universe, the oneness of all life. Life will take on a new meaning when we come into the realization of our at one meant with this great, creating, 
sustaining principle of the universe. The idea that there is but one principle running through the universe, one life, one truth, one reality, that this power is divinely beneficent, and that we are really in a great current running Godward, heavenward, is one of the most inspiring, encouraging, and fear-killing beliefs that has ever entered the human mind. The realization that in the truth of our being we are actually a part of this great, divine principle, a necessary, inseparable part of it, and that we can no more be annihilated than can the laws of mathematics, that we must partake of all of the qualities which compose our Creator, that we must be perfect and immortal because we were created by perfection, are a part of immortal principle, solves the greatest mysteries of life and gives us a wonderful sense of safety and contentment, which nothing else can give. Just in proportion as we realize this oneness with the Divine, this at one meant with our Maker, do our lives become calm, confident, creative. Our fear, our worry, our anxiety are indications that we have lost consciousness of our divine connection and have strayed from home, that we are out of tune with the infinite, in discord with divine principle. When one feels that his hand is gripped by the omnipotent hand, he is too near to God for doubt or fear, and he knows that no harm can come to him from any finite source, and all sense of fear vanishes. To feel that we are held always, everywhere by this divine hand and protected by omnipotent wisdom steadies the life wonderfully and gives a poise, an assurance, and confidence that nothing else can. The consciousness that we are actually to live, move, and have our being in the divinity will revolutionize our lives. When the mind is in us which was also in Christ, we shall never know fear again. As Whittier has beautifully said, I know not where his islands lift, their frond palms in air, I only know I cannot drift, beyond his love and care. Everyone should be able to dominate his own mentality, to be the master of his own mind at all times. It is pitiable to see a strong man in most things, a passive victim to the torturing thoughts which he should be able to strangle in an instant. The minds of many men are so affected by chronic anxiety and fear, that something is going to happen to them, their minds are so troubled with foreboding thoughts, that their judgment is not reliable. When fear steps in, good sense, good judgment, steps out. A man should be able to be master of his own mental realm. He should be able to detect the character of the guest thoughts which gain access to his mind. He should be able to open or close the gates of his mind, to include or exclude, as he chooses. But, when we look back over life and see what havoc fear and worry have made upon our digestion, our bodily functions, and our nerves, and how they have been destructive in the relations of our everyday life, we are appalled at their power. Thousands die annually from depressed spirits, disappointed hopes, thwarted ambitions, and premature exhaustion. We have not yet learned to cultivate that high-minded cheerfulness which is found in great souls, self-centered and confident in their own heaven-aided powers, that lofty cheerfulness which is the great preventive of humanity's ills. We have not yet learned, as a people, that grief, anxiety, and fear, are the great enemies of human life, and should be resisted as we resist the plague. Without cheerfulness there can be no healthy action, physical, mental, or moral, for it is the normal atmosphere of our being. The great thing is to keep one's physical, mental, and moral standards high, so that the worry, anxiety, fear germs cannot get a footing in our system. Our resisting power ought to be so great that it would be impossible for those enemies to get into the mind or body. The other day I came across this sentence which struck me quite forcefully, if you cannot be happy when you are miserable, you cannot be happy at all. The writer no doubt meant that the man who is a victim of his moods, who cannot command his mental outlook, who is not master of himself, but who goes up and down with the mood that happens to be upon him at the moment, cannot control his happiness. He cannot tell you whether he is going to be happy or not, 
because he does not know how he will feel at any particular time. Doctors could testify graphically to one of the worst results of chronic indulgences in fear and anxiety, and that is the growing use of narcotics. Modern worry is largely responsible for the alarming increase of the drug habit. It is a most unfortunate thing that so many patent medicines, which ignorant people think are specifics for all sorts of troubles, can be so easily procured at drugstores. All the preparations that contain morphine, cocaine, and alcohol, especially the headache specifics, are very dangerous in the hands of uninformed people, and often lead to tragic results. It is so easy for anyone to get deadly drugs that it is a great temptation for victims of the worry habit to seek relief in them. The self-drugging habit is one of the most dangerous symptoms of modern times. Medicines are put up in such attractive packages, so convenient to take and to carry in one's pocket, that the dangers of self-drugging are greatly increased. The use of these, nerve soothers, and panaceas, reflect seriously upon the way we are living and working today. The tendency to the drug habit is fairly inherent in the abnormal tension under which we battle for a livelihood and for happiness. Our nerves are continuously strained to the breaking point, we can't, let down, we lose the ability to surrender ourselves to normal influences for enjoyment. We must keep our capacity for enjoyment, we must find happiness at whatever cost. So, many people get into the way of depending on stimulants or narcotics to make happiness physically possible. They resort to drugs to escape their miseries and to realize whatever pleasurable sensations their jaded minds and senses may be able to get from life. When Francis Willard was first studying intemperance among the laboring classes in this country, she said. They are poor because they drink. But before long she inverted her inference and said. They drink because they are poor. Take the case of the common workman and victim of the gigantic steel industry in Pittsburgh. He must toil, a slave subdued to a system like a devouring minotaur, all his daytimes and even late into the night, with only a few hours, at long intervals, that he can call his own. Can we blame him when he snatches at that brief respite to swing the full length of the pendulum over into the world of vivid sensations that the grinding monotony of all his other days denies him, or into the realm of nirvana for shattered nerves and a body wound up like a machine that can never again find rest? He must get this reaction, or he will kill himself, or go insane. Such is nature's law. And how is a man who knows nothing except slavery of mind and body so to dispose himself, mentally and spiritually, in those brief hours of freedom, as to receive the real happiness of life? He thinks he has only one means of getting the indispensable reaction. Only one sort of happiness is open to him. He thinks he must go and get as drunk as he can, and for a little while monotony and pain will be dispelled, and dreams and grateful oblivion will possess him. This is an extreme example. But it serves the more graphically to show an abnormal tendency of our times to which all of us, in measure, as life today makes drudges and machines of us, are prone. We fear to lose our sensibility for enjoyment of life. We worry lest pain and trouble deprive us of happiness. And if our souls cannot or will not replace fear and worry with true happiness in daily living, then we resort to external means, such as drugs and stimulants, to give us the pathological counterfeit of happiness. Formerly there were very few things which people would resort to to acquire a feeling of well-being and try to force their jaded nerves and vitiated brains and faculties to give up by artificial means, something which they could not generate by natural ones. Nowadays we see men constantly running to the barrooms for a bracer. At the clubs they are always wanting a cocktail, and they cannot get along without a cigar or cigarette in their mouth much of the time. Businessmen are constantly goading their nervous system and brain to give out something that isn't there. 
They keep forcing themselves by these artificial means until they use up all their reserves, so that they have no resisting power when disease or illness comes. Worry and fear have made more drunkards than almost any other cause. Anything that will vanish care, relieve the strain of worry and anxiety, anything that will bring peace of mind is what a disturbed, distressed, and anxious humanity is seeking. The millions of men who are constantly running into saloons for a bracer, do so believing that they will get at least a temporary uplift or relief from the things that trouble them, and that they will then be in a better position to do their work. Few of them realize to what this constant stimulation from liquors, tobacco, coffee, drugs, will lead, they do not realize that they must pay for these prods, these stimulants, by a fatal reaction. Men do not realize that all a drink of whiskey does is to paralyze for the time being the nerves of the walls of the blood vessels in the brain, thus letting in an additional supply of blood, causing temporary congestion and additional brain stimulus, due to the surplus of brain nutriment floating in the blood, and that this condition must always be followed by a corresponding reaction mental depression. All this but emphasizes more strongly our innate need of happiness, and the fatal influence of fear and worry. Why is it that most of us, who are fortunate enough in the place we have found in the world, are not more capable of happiness? The trouble is that we do not look within for the mainspring of power. It is a strange thing that man should look outside of himself for the very help that is inside him. The moment a man depends upon outside help, he cuts himself off from the source of power, he severs the divine cable. He drops the trolley pole so that he no longer draws his power from the divine current. He tries, without looking to his higher nature, to propel his car, it has all of the divine machinery, all the mechanism for drawing off divine energy, but only if he will connect his trolley pole of faith and truth with the divine current. It is a reflection upon him who made us, to be always worrying, fretting, and anxious, for, if we were in touch with infinite power, we should be serene and balanced. It is as much our duty to repel every enemy of health and happiness as to keep thieves out of our homes. Worry and anxiety have no more right to darken our lives than wild beasts have to live in our homes. They are just as much out of place. Harmony is as normal to the man God made as it is to music. Be sure not to worry. Keep cheerful and don't worry. These common injunctions of a doctor when he leaves a patient, show the universal belief of physicians in the fatal, blighting, health-destroying influence of worry. Physicians look upon it as a curse. Worry poisons the blood, impairs the nutrition, and poisoned blood poisons the thought, and deteriorates all of the mental processes. A day of worry is more exhausting than a week of work. Worry upsets our whole system, work keeps it in health and order. Many honest, well-intentioned, hard-working people suffer a great deal from night worry. It is wicked for God's children who are doing their best to do their share in the world and make it a better place to live in, to be unhappy. Right living entitles everyone to happiness. I have made it a rule of my life, said a prominent English clergyman, never to think of anything disagreeable after nine o'clock at night. Every moment of worry weakens the soul for its daily combat, writes a well-known preacher. Worry is an infirmity, there is no virtue in it. Worry is spiritual nearsightedness, a fumbling way of looking at little things, and of magnifying their value. Worry is a species of insanity. We would count a man insane who took a dose of poison every day to promote his health. He is no less mentally unbalanced who desires happiness and yet indulges a habit of worrying. It is like walking south to find the north, it is like going into a cellar to look for rainbows. It paralyzes the powers by which the evil thing may be averted. What would you think of a man on the verge of bankruptcy, 
who was trying in every way possible to get together money enough to relieve himself from his embarrassment or to save his business or property, who would draw from the bank several times a day a few dollars and throw them away or spend them foolishly. Do you realize, you worrier, that you are doing something infinitely more foolish? Your brain power, your creative ability, your energy, are your capital, with which you are to solve your life problem, and yet, every sleepless night you spend worrying over your affairs, every moment of anxiety, of fretting and stewing, and nervous tension, is draining off your precious capital. Your brain capital, nerve capital, vitality capital, which should help you to clear up your perplexing problems, you are not only squandering, but you are also making yourself and those around you unhappy, destroying the harmony of your home, committing suicide upon months, and, perhaps, years of your life. All the time you are depending upon things outside of yourself to give you peace of mind, comfort, happiness, success. But these things are subject to accident, and you are risking all that life ought to mean to you in pinning your faith to things which are outside your control. Now, there ought to be something in a life which is beyond the reach of accident, beyond the possibility of being wrecked by chance. Think of a man capable of leading hundreds or thousands of employees in a great enterprise, a man of achievement, born to do great things, lying around for days, as I have known a businessman to do, the victim of the blues, in the clutch of mental demons which he ought to be able to throttle in five minutes. Man certainly has an inherent right to success and happiness that is inalienable. God's children are not the victims of chance, are not the playthings of a cold, cruel destiny beyond their control. Courage and cheerfulness are within our own will power, they are our safety, and self-preservation. There is no worse tyrant than the demon worry, but he is a master of our own choosing. He cannot force his rule upon us against our will. There are certain events, indeed, which come upon us unawares, certain psychic states which we cannot foresee nor escape. But, once we are conscious of those moods, we may become master of them. We may turn the darkest experience to the account of happiness. There is no joy equal to that of conquering bitterness, of overcoming sorrow. In such a victory we find a happiness beyond all our dreams of happiness. We are challenged today to overcome worry, but this takes us back to the ancient fight with fear. Fear must go. Yet, through long conflict we have not been able to crush his citadel or drive him from his powerful seat. He continues to hold sway, the arch enemy of the race, the great robber baron who plunders our hard-hoarded store of human happiness and efficiency, who makes of men cowards, obsessed with worry, anxiety, jealousy, and the sense of failure. It is high time we realize that he is not to be forced off his throne by crude attack. Instead, we must, unknown to him, invite in another stronger than he. As fear works havoc with the imagination, so must this newcomer absorb our thoughts and feelings in a yet stronger way, until at length he draws to himself the allegiance we have so long given fear. He shall be fear's antidote, and his name is Faith. When we have given our allegiance to Faith, then shall we see fear toppling from his ancient throne. We cannot drag him off by force but we can push him aside little by little to make room for a greater master of the human spirit than he. And when fear shall be no more, worry, too, shall leave us, both the old enemy and the new disease, the twin enemies of happiness. Man shall find a sublime, new self-faith, he shall rest in such sense of security, freedom, ability, as he cannot now conceive, and his efficiency shall partake of the divine creative power. Chapter 6 the strain to keep up appearances kills happiness. You can buy a lot of home happiness with a mighty small salary, but fashionable happiness always costs just a little more than you're making. You can't keep down expenses when you've got to keep up appearances that is, the appearance of being something that you ain't. 
Not long ago the home of a New York widow, and all her other property that the law did not exempt, were sold at auction. It was found that this overambitious mother, in her efforts to marry her daughters into families much above their station, had made desperate efforts to keep up appearances, and had run into debts which had finally cost her her home. It was found that she owed large amounts to the florists, the caterers, the milliners, and the dry goods people, and that she had been living for a long time far beyond her income, keeping up appearances which were perpetual lies. All this she did because of her insane ambition to marry her daughters to rich men. The family could have lived in comfort on her modest income, but for the mother's false life standards. Thousands of dollars were squandered in buying hats, dresses, expensive laces, and all sorts of finery, so that her daughters might shine as brilliantly as other young women who had many times their means. Now the mother is without a home and the daughters remain still without husbands. It is over vaulting ambition, selfishness, the everlasting striving and struggling in the most unnatural way to keep up appearances, which causes much of the unhappiness in homes. Why is it that people burn out their lives with discontent and misery, struggling, striving, making slaves of themselves to keep up appearances, in great cities, without knowing what real enjoyment, real life means, when they might be so contented and happy, might be somebody and stand for something in a smaller town, where people were not so money mad, and ambition crazy. I know two young married people in New York who are perfectly wretched because they cannot get into fashionable society and live and dress like those whom they envy, and whose example they are not able to follow. They are always anxious and worried, and they never feel that they can afford to take much real comfort, except when they are making an impression upon others. They feel that they must spend everything for appearances, because they are slaves of other people's opinions. It is not so much our lack of comforts, or of luxury, as our envy, our selfishness, our false standards that make us unhappy. What terrible inconvenience, hardship, and suffering we endure on account of other people's eyes and opinions. What slaves, what fools we make of ourselves because of what other people think. How we scheme and contrive to make them think we are other than we really are. It is other people's eyes that are expensive. It is other people's eyes that make us unhappy and discontented with our lot, that make us strain and struggle and slave, in order to keep up false appearances. The struggle to keep up with those in better circumstances is one of the tragedies of the times. Debt is one of the greatest sources of unhappiness, especially with young married people. In a large city like New York, many people feel that they are nobodies. They cannot keep up appearances commensurate with their degree of education, refinement, and culture. They cannot get into the society for which their tastes fit them, and they do not wish to associate with what they call the vulgar, uncultured masses. They feel that they are neither one thing nor the other in such a big city. I know families in New York who live in perpetual misery because of this condition of things. I have in mind a businessman who has a very small income, but both himself and wife are educated, cultured, and have refined tastes, and they simply will not live in any part of the city in keeping with their income. The result is that they are obliged to strain so much to live in the more fashionable neighborhoods that they have very little for food and clothing and recreation after paying their rent. Many people seem to think that it is a disgrace not to have a big income, that the great desideratum of life is to be able to spend a lot of money upon luxuries. But, after all, what is there in it? Often unhappiness, ill health from trying to get too much out of life, from overeating, overdrinking, and dissipation. On the other hand there are plenty of people who take scant pleasure in life because they are slaves to false economy and overwork. Their economy is niggardly, mean, stingy, even in their homes. They are always scolding about picayune wastes of life, 
cautioning everybody not to use too much of this or that, and making everybody about them miserable. I know a man who harps upon using too much butter and too much meat to such an extent that other members of the family fairly dread meal times. They dislike to put on a new pair of shoes or other articles of clothing because the head of the house will make such a fuss and ask if their purchase was necessary. One of the meanest traits of stingy husbands is their inclination to exert a censorship over the wife's expenditures. It takes all the joy and interest out of her end of the partnership. If the wife happens to make a mistake in getting a bad bargain, many a man will get into a rage and make her miserable when perhaps he himself makes all sorts of foolish bargains, and takes home things which the wife knows are absolutely useless and that the money paid for them was practically thrown away. I know a man who rarely ever asks his wife what she wants in the home, or gives her money with which to buy things herself. He will buy furniture and bric-a-brac, all sorts of things at auctions and bargain sales which do not match anything in the home, which are entirely out of place, and yet the wife does not dare to criticize her husband. He will buy a complete set of some author's works because he gets them cheap, when, perhaps there is not a single volume among them which anyone in the home would care to read, and the wife knows perfectly well that a few selected volumes from choice authors would be worth more than a whole library of such rubbish as the husband has brought home. There is probably no one quality which is more misunderstood and abused than economy. Especially is this true in the home. False economy is fatal to the home joy. In some homes saving becomes a fetish. Multitudes of things are put away in attics and cupboards and closets which can never be used, and which are a nuisance and ought to be burned up. I have in mind a home where the atmosphere of poverty and denial predominates. The family does without even many of the comforts of life. False ideas of saving have so infected every member that it is positively painful to visit them. Only a little while ago I was at dinner in this house and the little boy of six remarked that they had mackerel that evening because they could get it cheaper than any other fish. Even the small children would ask the cost of things at the table when guests were present. Many men allow their wives to wear themselves out in their early married life, to enable them to save a little money and get a start in the world, then after they become prosperous they are ashamed of their wives, because through hard work and self-denial for false economy's sake they have lost all their attractiveness. Then many of these men conclude that they are not congenial, and they get a divorce, and marry some young, attractive girl who can shine in society. The Governor's Lady, is a recent drama out of real life. I have seen in Washington men who have risen in the world and have gotten into Congress or obtained government appointments, who have come up from poverty by dint of the most extreme economizing in the home, and who have lost infinitely less in the struggle than their wives. I have seen them at public gatherings, where they not only did not seem at all proud to introduce their wives, but even avoided doing so, and devoted themselves to more attractive, younger women. At a reception, not long ago, I met a multimillionaire who had worked his way to the front from extreme poverty, and whose wife had sacrificed her beauty and all her grace of form and her charm in the terrible struggle to help him on his feet and practically out of bankruptcy in their younger days. She had a sweet face, but it was sad. There was character there, but almost a total lack of the charm which attracts selfish men. The man himself was faultlessly dressed, splendidly groomed. He was fresh and vigorous, because his constitution was very much stronger than his wife's. He was so much engaged in chatting, talking, and laughing with the more comely ladies that he scarcely had time to introduce his poor wife, who sat like a wallflower in the background, plainly dressed, and very conscious that her years of hard work and pinching and saving had robbed her of the very attractiveness which first charmed her husband. Only twice during the entire reception did I see this man introduce anyone to his wife, and then in a very perfunctory manner. 
It could hardly seem possible that this very unattractive and apparently hard-working woman, in whom the joy of life was crushed out, could be the wife of this handsome, magnetic man, who, by the way, never liked to work, and who had not proposed to wear himself out, or worry himself to death, in getting a living. I happen to know the history of this man's wealth, and that his success was due mostly to his wife's shrewdness, and as much to her hard work and self-denial as to his ability. He let his wife do the worrying and the scrimping. Yet now that he has the money she is practically sidetracked. He flies over the country in his splendid automobile, is much in demand because he can afford to spend generously, but his unattractive wife, except on rare occasions, remains at home. This is how he has retained his physical attractiveness and robustness, and why, now that they are in the very height of their prosperity, just ready to enjoy what they possess, the wife is already a gone by. A very unattractive old age stares her in the face, while, though no older in years, he is in the flower of his manhood. The young wife was too unselfish, too devoted, too anxious to save and to help her husband get on in the world, to spare her strength or try to preserve her beauty. She was willing to give her all to help him, but now he does not appreciate it. Thus selfishness and niggardly economy have slain her happiness and their chance of happiness together in their home in old age. In our day the home rides the waves between Scylla and Charybdis, in peril of being torn asunder in the whirlpools of extravagance or ground to pieces on the harsh rocks of false economy. The home cannot find happiness, except it steer its course away into calmer seas of contentment, simplicity, a pleasant thrift and sane enjoyment of life. Chapter 7, Contentment, The Secret of Happiness Knots had, all spent, when our desire is got without content. Why thus longing, thus forever sighing, for the far off, unattained and dim, while the beautiful, all round thee lying, offers up its low, perpetual hymn? The average American sees just about as much of real life, of the things worthwhile, as he sees of the beautiful scenery through which he passes, driving his car at a high speed. Of course now and then he diverts his eyes long enough to get a hasty glimpse of a mountain peak or a beautiful valley or a gorgeous sunset, but the beautiful scenery, the details of the glorious flowers, are all lost upon him. All the wonderful details of little experiences, the fine courtesies, the exquisite things of life, the things that are worthwhile, are lost to us because we live at such a terrific pace. We cannot take time to see things, to appreciate them, to enjoy them. We do not take time to enjoy our friends. Our whole mind is anxiously focused upon the machine and the road in front of us. We are like men who carry the mails on the Pony Express. We are borne along at a terrific speed, and we only dismount to mount again. And so we go tearing through life forever changing from a tired to a fresh pony. Bent forms, premature gray hair, heavy steps, and feverish haste are indicative of American life. Restlessness and discontent have become chronic, and are characteristic of our age and nation. This straining, struggling, and striving is not life, it is a fever, a disease, well-named Americanitis. It bears no relation to happiness. Oliver Wendell Holmes, when questioned as to the secret of his marvelous youthfulness, in his 80th year, replied that it was due chiefly, to a cheerful disposition and invariable contentment in every period of my life with what I was. I never felt the pangs of ambition. It is restlessness, ambition, discontent, and disquietude that make us grow old prematurely by carving wrinkles on our faces. Wrinkles do not appear on faces that have constantly smiled. Smiling is the best possible massage. Contentment is the fountain of youth. The sort of ambition the genial doctor condemns is that in which egotism and vanity figure most conspicuously, 
and in which notoriety, the praise and admiration of the world, wealth, and personal aggrandizement are the object sought, rather than the power to be of use in the world, to be a leader in the service of humanity, and to be the noblest, best, and most efficient worker that one can be. Oh, happy day for him who gives up striving to be richer, wiser, more clever than his fellows, and settles down content to be himself. And when abates the fever of possession and he perceives that the riches of the rich, the joy of the happy, and the strength of the strong are his as well, then indeed for him has the millennium dawned. Shakespeare said, My crown is in my heart, not on my head, nor decked with diamonds and Indian stones. Nor to be seen, my crown is called content, a crown it is, that seldom kings enjoy. Now and then we meet characters so entrenched in principle, so rich in personality and heart graces, which money will not buy, that the wealthiest people might envy them. Although often poor in material possessions they are rich in heart qualities, rich in contentment, in harmony, in things that are worthwhile. People who have money, but little else, cannot understand why they cannot purchase these things. They travel all over the world to find happiness and yet what they get is but a contemptible imitation of the real wealth of these simple, sweet, beautiful characters, many of whom are never able to indulge in life's material luxuries. I know a poor woman who has very little of the good things of the world, but it is a rich experience to hear her tell of the wonderful beauty she sees in the landscape, in the seascape, in the sunsets, and in the flowers. She appreciates the beauties of nature spread all around us, which most of us see without thinking of or enjoying, and all the little things of life, the common experiences which most of us think little about, are full of rich meaning for her and give her infinite pleasure. Did you ever stop to consider that in all probability you are just as truly living right at this moment, as you ever can live? that you are just now going through the only sort of life you may ever experience on this earth? The habit of thinking and asserting that things are as you would like to have them, as they ought to be, holding tenaciously the mental picture of yourself as you want to be, thinking and asserting your wholeness, completeness, and that you cannot lack anything, because you are one with the all good, one with the principle that made you, will not alone help you to realize your desires but also will give you a marvelous sense of serenity and contentment. The life follows the thought. When the mind dwells upon a certain line of thought for a long time, it tends to bring the whole life into harmony with it. The constant dwelling upon and contemplating the beautiful, sublime, noble, and true, and the effort to incorporate them into the life, make the character beautiful. Our longings, our desires, are outpictured in our lives. The desire is the pattern the life processes tend to reproduce. Many of us instead of finding our happiness in things close at hand and in our everyday associations, in our work and experience, look to the future and long for other days and other conditions, when we assure ourselves we shall obtain perfect happiness. It is but a vain dream. That hour never comes and never will. He who does not find content and satisfaction today, who does not rejoice in the sunshine and the blessings God gives him moment by moment, will never find the path to paradise and will live and die discontented. It is out of the ordinary duties, the common routine affairs of the ordinary day, in the home, in the store, in the factory, dealing with common, homely, everyday duties, that we manufacture life and all that it means to us. The extraordinary, unusual things do not affect us nearly so much as the common ordinary affairs of our daily life, which are constantly molding us. When will people learn that happiness is as legitimate a product of our thought, our effort, our aims and ambitions, our mental attitude, our outlook upon life? as the correct answer to a mathematical problem is the result of scientific procedure? Somehow most people seem to think that happiness can be found, just as people find gold, that there is a great deal of luck about it. To many, 
Happiness is a sort of Captain Kidd's treasure, and they bankrupt themselves of the real sources of pleasure, health, contentment, family affection, feverishly to seek a mythical hoard of gold. Undoubtedly, ambition stands in the way of more people's contentment and happiness than almost anything else. The foolish determination to do what others do, to get ahead of others and to be able to live as they do, to have the luxuries and comforts of people who are better off than they, this overvaulting ambition is one of the great happiness enemies. It is a false ambition which keeps us pulling and hauling and straining to do something which somebody else has done, not because we need it ourselves, not because it would add a particle to our comfort or real welfare, or because it is really worthwhile, but because we are eaten up with the canker of an overvaulting ambition, the chief element of which is selfishness, the desire to outshine others, to outdo them, to get ahead of them, to live a little better off than they, to have a little better home, a little better house in a little better part of the town, to dress our children a little better, to surround ourselves with more luxuries. But, after all, are these things really helpful, are they really worthwhile? Growth, enlargement of life, enrichment of one's nature, these are the things that are worthwhile. It is the ambition to be a man, to stand for more in the community, to push our horizon of ignorance farther and farther away from us, to think a little higher each day, to think a little more of ourselves, to have a little more faith in ourselves and in everybody else, an ambition to be of real use in the world, which, if achieved, will bring contentment and true happiness. Everywhere we see lopped, one-sided, unbalanced men, mere dwarfs or apologies of the men God intended, who have starved their social and aesthetic faculties, their symmetry, their mental growth, in their restless strife to put a little more money into their purse. What will a man not do when drunk with an overleaping, inordinate ambition? Multitudes have sacrificed family, homes, friendships, health, comforts, and honor itself, to appease that awful burning fever within, that terrible craving of the ambition for more, more, that perpetual hunger and thirst which are never satisfied. On every hand we see men whose faculties have become marbleized by following avaricious ambition. Grasping greed, like the starling which ever cries, more, more, chokes all their nobler aspirations, blighting all that is fine, delicate, and sensitive in their natures, until they become blunt and irresponsive to all that is beautiful, sweet, and true. Oh, what a pitiable sight is that of a human being in the mad clutches of a greedy aim. When a man has once become the victim of a selfish, sordid, money-mad ambition, he is practically dead to all that is best in life. He does not appreciate the glory and the grandeur, the sublimity, of existence. His pleasures are all of the coarser, animal kind. How we deceive ourselves by this mirage of the future, which a selfish ambition pictures. We are always getting ready to live, neglecting the present, focusing our eyes upon the future, always straining for something yet to come, and never half appreciating what we have, or enjoying as we go along. Is there anything more foolish than the idea that many people possess that the future will be very different from the present? Is there any reason for thinking that tomorrow will be any different from today? Why do we allow the mirage of tomorrow to keep our eyes from the beauties of today? Why do we allow anticipated joys to blind us to those that are close by us? We trample down the violets and the daisies trying to reach the larger blossoms on the trees. Woe be to him who caters to a selfish ambition, and follows it blindly, who expects it to give him peace of mind when it is realized, for the more a greedy ambition is fed, the more ravenous its appetite. It is like the fire water in the enchanted story, the more the victim drinks of it, the greater his burning fever. A selfish ambition is a fatal guide, and will surely wreck the happiness of those who follow it. It will rob one of all that is dearest and sweetest in life. It will murder his enjoyment as he goes along, by holding up alluring pictures of the future, 
which will never become realities. Oh, what a fatal price men have paid for the mad following of this will owe the wisp, ambition. What tragedies have followed it? The majority of men seem to think they can purchase happiness. They may purchase animal pleasures, but the stimulation of the nerves, the titillation of the nervous system is a very cheap and comparatively low pleasure, and does not even approximate to joy or happiness, which is not purchasable, except by merit. They mistake pleasure for happiness. No one has yet been able to bribe real happiness. There is one price for it, and the poor may gain it as well as the rich. The world is full of happiness, and there is always plenty to go round, if we are only willing to take the kind that comes our way. Most people seek happiness selfishly. They try to find something which will make them feel more comfortable, give some sort of easement to their disagreeable feelings and bad moods. The great majority of people in this world have an idea that happiness consists in the satisfaction which comes from gratified desires. But this is always a delusion, the satiety of desire is always followed by a reaction, an ever-increased call for more gratification. The appetite of passion survives all possibilities of satisfaction. The more it is indulged, the more imperious the craving. The appetite survives even when the victim is exhausted. The animal thirst can never be quenched. How often we hear people give expression to the thought that they don't get much out of life anyway. Now this very spirit of trying to see how much they can get out of life is what causes them to get so little. It is the people who put the most into life that get the most out of it. A farmer might as well sit still and see how much he can get out of his farm without sowing and planting. It is the people who give the most to life who get the most out of it. With many people life seems something to plunder instead of to cultivate to the utmost. Just like the farmer who would till a particular piece of land from which he is trying to win a prize, you must put as much as you can into life, make it just as rich as possible. Put love and contentment into it, cheerfulness and unselfish service, then you will not go around complaining that you get so little out of life, that the world has no reward to offer you. There is a good, healthful discontent, and there is a bad, unwholesome discontent, says Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Unless you have a grateful heart, a heart which lifts itself in earnest thanks to God for something, then your discontent is probably purely selfish. There can be no life which does not contain something to be grateful for, and the habit of gratitude is one of the most powerful assets of success and happiness which can be named. If you wake in the morning and say, I thank God for this new day of life and for whatever blessings are mine, then you can safely say to yourself and to your Creator, afterward, that you are not satisfied with your environment or with your situation, and ask for strength and guidance to change it and better it. Real happiness comes from the cultivation, the development, of the highest that is in us. Selfishness can never bring happiness, because it is constantly developing, enlarging the greedy, grasping nature, is constantly encouraging the very thing which leads us away from happiness. You will not find happiness unless you seek it with a pure heart, with a clean mind, a noble purpose, with unselfish aim and unselfish desire for the welfare of others. Suppose that the way does look dark to you, that you see no light, no opening, do not take it for granted that there is no way out for you, that you will have no way to express what God has locked up in you just because you happen to be temporarily tied to an iron environment and see no way of getting away from it. Wait, and work, and have faith. The closing of one door always means the opening of another. The right mental attitude is a powerful magnet, and whatever you desire to have or to be, you should affirm constantly to yourself that you have that thing, that you are what you long to be. If you wish to be well and strong, if you wish to have vigorous health, to have plenty instead of poverty, constantly say to yourself, I am well, I live in abundance, 
there can be no lack, no poverty, no want, in my life, I am wealth because I am principal. How can people expect to become happy and contented who are always dwelling upon their miseries, misfortunes, and sorrows, always expressing discontent in their thoughts and actions? There is no philosophy by which a negative mental attitude will produce its opposite. Like thought, like man. Our state of mind is the logical result of our thought. The only happiness that can possibly come to you is the scientific product of your thinking and your getting. If you are dissatisfied with the kind of happiness you have had, and will analyze it, you will find it is absolutely just. It is merely the result, the scientific product, of past experiences, thoughts, and actions. So, if you are discontented and miserable, you will find that you alone are to blame. If you had used the ingredients which form real happiness you could no more have failed to have obtained the result than you can fail to get the right answer to a mathematical problem when you have followed the mathematical law. It will do you no good to chase all over the world trying to find happiness. If you do not carry it with you you will never find it. History is strewn with wrecks of those who pursued happiness desperately all their lives and never once caught up with it, while multitudes of others who never thought much about happiness, but were intensely busy with their duties, busy trying to provide for the home and those dear to them and to make life a little easier, a little more comfortable, for those about them, were surprised to find that it came to them unsought. The pitiful part of this inalienable right to the pursuit of happiness, says Charles Dudley Warner, is, however, that most men interpret it to mean the pursuit of wealth, and strive for that always, postponing being happy until they get a fortune, and if they are lucky in that, find in the end that happiness has somehow eluded them, that, in short, they have not cultivated that in themselves which alone can bring happiness. I know a man who has made quite a distinguished success in his specialty and yet he is as uneasy, dissatisfied, and discontented as any man I know. He is always comparing himself with people who have been more successful, who have done more and better work in his line and who have accumulated more money. The sight of people who have gotten along faster, the thought of their living better, or having a better reputation, more fame, irritates him. His eyes are so intent upon others' accomplishments and what they have that he seems blind to what he has accomplished and what he has. His own humbler surroundings mean scarcely anything to him. He has an ideal family, a noble wife, superb children, and although his home is not as sumptuous or commodious, nor his environment as luxurious or grand as that of some of his neighbors, yet he has a multitude of advantages over them. Somehow, his strong constitution, his healthy and harmonious family do not seem to count for very much with him. He has a faraway look in his eyes, his gaze is so set upon what others do and what others have, that he does not seem to know how to appreciate his own, and he is always castigating himself for not working harder, and getting on more rapidly, notwithstanding the fact that he is always overworking and never takes time to cultivate friendships or to enjoy social life. Now, if this man would only realize the fact, he could revolutionize his mental attitude in a few months so that he would be a completely changed man. If every day he would stop for a few minutes and empty his mind of his envy and jealousy, and would thrust out his false ambition and try to appreciate his own instead of forever thinking of what others have, if every morning he would congratulate himself upon his good fortune in having such a happy and harmonious family, a beautiful wife and fine robust children. When many of those whom he envies have to bear all sorts of marital discords and troubles, frivolous wives and deformed and even imbecile children, he would learn to appreciate his own blessings. In thinking how fortunate he is in his happy environment, he would develop a capacity for appreciation, and what others have would lose its peculiar fascination. Many of us miss the joys that might be ours by keeping our eyes fixed on those of other people. No one can enjoy his own opportunities for happiness while he is envious of another's. 
We lose a great deal of the joy of living by not cheerfully accepting the small pleasures that come to us every day, instead of longing and wishing for what belongs to others. We do not take any pleasure in our own modest car, because we long for the luxurious limousine that someone else owns. The edge is taken off the enjoyment of our own little home because we are watching the palatial residence of our neighbor. We can get no satisfaction out of a trolley ride into the country or a sail on a river steamer, because someone else can enjoy the luxury of his own touring car or yacht. Life has its full measure of happiness for every one of us, if we would only make up our minds to make the very most of every opportunity that comes our way, instead of longing for the things that come our neighbor's way. How many of us are like the buttercup that grew in the field beside the daisy? The buttercup was discontented and envied the daisy, for daisies grow so trim and tall, and she always had a longing to wear a frill around her neck too. But a robin, who was flying by, heard her lamentation and told her how foolish she was to want to be a made-up daisy instead of her own bright self. He told her to look bravely up into the sky, and be content with knowing, that God wished for a buttercup, just here where you are growing. A discontented, discordant mortal is no more a man than discord is music. Robert Burns described the happy man, when he said he was contented with little and happy with more. Be content with such things as ye have, says the Apostle. Such noble contentment opens the way to larger fullness and satisfaction. The power of the will, the influence of our own mind, the way we accept life, the interpretation we give to facts and experiences is a determining factor in our enjoyment or disappointment in this world. Chapter 8 Home Joy Killers We have careful thought for the stranger, and smiles for the sometime guest, but oft for our own the bitter tone, though we love our own the best. Did you ever come across the American hog at home, the man who is so affable, such a genial good fellow in the club downtown and among his men friends and business associates, but who, when in his home, throws off his mask and feels no obligation to restrain himself or to temper his language, the man who finds fault with everything, abuses everybody, criticizes everything, who storms about the house like a mad bull when he is out of sorts and things do not please him. We have all undoubtedly met this man, the good fellow at the club and the hog at home. The American hog at home is a very curious animal. I have seen him in the midst of a terrible rage when he seemed to be the plaything of his passion, become as gentle and docile as a lamb in an instant with the ringing of a doorbell and the announcing of company. It would seem as though there must be some magical connection between the doorbell and this man's temper. When it did not seem possible for him to get control of himself, he did not have the slightest difficulty in calming down in an instant's time when a caller was announced thus proving that this matter of self-control was largely one of vanity, self-pride. He would be mortally ashamed to have the caller see the hog husband that was there when the doorbell rang. We often see him in the home sitting cross, crabbed, glum, during the entire evening and at meals, without making the slightest effort to be agreeable. At the club or in his business dealings, even if things go wrong, he feels obliged to restrain himself and be decent because he would not have his business friends see him with his mask off. He has too much pride and vanity for that. But when he is at home he thinks he is under no obligation to be agreeable, he thinks he has a perfect right to do just what he feels like doing, and to be just as mean, hateful, and disagreeable as he wants to be. He makes no attempt to restrain or control himself. Such boorishness and lack of companionableness between husband and wife are among the most common domestic joy killers. Of course the woman is often at fault, but she is more naturally a homemaker at heart than the man. He is more selfish and apt to be indifferent to the home, and he is the one who needs to be roused to the responsibility of making home happy, and marriage full of mutual joy in giving. 
If there are women who do not, by study in that best companionship which they could offer to their husbands, truly learn rightly to play the part of helpmeets, there are far more men who, for one selfish reason or another, never give their wives the opportunity, writes Mrs. John Logan. A woman's thirst for sympathy and close companionship is very difficult for the average man to comprehend. It would be as impossible for a woman to live her normal life under abuse or indifference without sympathetic companionship, as for a rose to develop its normal beauty and fragrance without sunshine. This is often the reason why so many wives seek elsewhere the sympathy which their husbands deny them. There are men who think that if they do not actually strike their wives, if they provide a house and clothing for them, they ought to be satisfied and happy. But these things will never ensure happiness to the kind of a woman you would desire your wife to be, my friend. It often occurs that a man marries a beautiful, bright, cheerful girl who was always bubbling over with animal spirits, and in a short time everybody notices a complete change in her character, brought about by the perpetual suppression of her husband, who if not actually brutal is severe in his criticisms and unreasonable in his demands. The wife is surrounded with this joy-killing atmosphere of sharp criticism or severity until she entirely loses her naturalness and spontaneity, and self-expression becomes impossible. The result is an artificial, flavorless character. Think of the suffering of a wife who feels her spirits gradually drying up, and her buoyancy and youthfulness evaporating, her beauty, her attractiveness gradually fading, in fact, her ambition strangled, her whole life being blighted in a cold, loveless environment. Someone recently told me that not once during several months which they spent at the home of friends did they see the husband display the slightest sign of affection for his wife, although she is a woman vastly superior to him in every way. She has dragged out an unloved, miserable existence for more than a quarter of a century, with a husband who is cold and absolutely indifferent to her comfort, pleasure, or happiness. Not once in a year does he take her anywhere. He is practically never seen with her away from home. He never thinks she needs an outing, a vacation, or a change. When he travels, he goes alone or in the company of others, never even suggesting that his wife accompany him. This man is not unkind or cruel, he is only indifferent to his wife. He has not a particle sentiment for her. To many women indifference is worse than cruelty, if the cruel husband shows at least a little affection now and then. Utter indifference is one of the things that the feminine heart cannot endure without keen suffering. Indifference and cruelty are evident forms of selfishness, the root of domestic unhappiness. Less evident, perhaps, is that self-love which many men mistake for love of their wives. It is a sort of projection of themselves with which they are in love. They think more of their own comfort, their own well-being, their own ambitions, their own pleasure, than they do of the highest welfare of their wives. Many such men do not mean to be selfish in their home life, and really believe they are generous, but their minds are so focused upon themselves and their ambition that they can only think of a wife in reference to themselves. Whereas the highest love has the highest welfare of the individual at heart, not its own. It is fortunate for the world that a woman's love is not so selfish, not so self-centered as a man's. If it were, civilization would go back to barbarism. When a woman has given up everything for a husband who, before marriage was always bringing her flowers and showing other little evidences of his affection, who was generous and loving and kind, but who afterwards seldom thinks of these little attentions so much appreciated by women, but is often indifferent, cross, and fault-finding, she cannot help feeling unhappy at the contrast. It does not seem possible that a man who could be so affectionate, kind, and considerate while pursuing the object of his regard, could become indifferent and cruel after he had secured the prize, but this is true of multitudes of men. With many men romance ends with marriage, 
as a hunter's interest dies with the game when he has fired the shot that kills. I have been in the home of a married couple where the husband showed the greatest lack of feeling for his wife, and treated her more as a menial than as a companion. If she complained of a headache, or of feeling unwell, he never showed any sympathy for her, but, on the contrary, appeared to be provoked, and often made sarcastic remarks. He never tried in any way to lighten her burdens, nor showed her any special attention. He was not even polite to her. He would take no part of the responsibility of training the children or of conducting the household. He said he would not be bothered with such things. He spent most of his evenings at the clubs, or in the company of women whom he considered more attractive than his wife, and upon whom he spent money freely, but he was extremely penurious with his wife, and made her give an account of what she did with every penny. He became so brazen in his open association with other women that he often took them to his own home, where his wife, who was suffering tortures, tried to receive them graciously and to treat them kindly. If there is any person who needs pity in the world, it is the wife who gives love and makes perpetual sacrifices in return for indifference, neglect, and even cruelty. Is it not a crime for a man to take a beautiful, affectionate, buoyant girl from a happy home, after a romantic courtship, and then crush her spirit, and freeze her love by cold, heartless indifference and selfishness, to wreck her happiness? Can any greater disappointment come into a woman's life than to see her dream of love, marriage, and a happy home blighted by cold-hearted, indifferent, cruel neglect? Jealousy and suspicion poison the atmosphere of the family. The home joy cannot live where they are entertained. At the outset young people who marry should resolve never to permit the sun to go down on their wrath. Lovers fondly fancy that they will never have a quarrel. However, most husbands and wives occasionally have little differences which need not amount to much if they simply follow one rule, never to go to sleep at night except in friendly harmony. If there has been a disturbance of peace, settle it before bedtime. If either has done or said anything to wound the other, confess and seek forgiveness before the head touches the pillow. We take offense too easily, write someone. I know cases of husbands and wives who, in a discussion over a matter of perhaps no real importance, get offended with each other, and the husband goes away without his usual morning kiss, goes downtown and is miserable all day long, and the wife stays at home and is miserable all day long, and over what? They forget the time when she was the one ideal of all that was beautiful, they forget the time when he was the one hero picked out of all the sons of earth. For a contemptible, petty little nothing they think unkindly and harshly of each other. Is a little trifle like that worth purchasing at the price of the happiness of a day? How petty it is. If people would only stop and think, they would be ashamed of themselves, and ask each other's pardon, and devote themselves to creating sunshine and peace instead of getting offended over things that are of no earthly account, looked at from any point of view. How true are the following lines of the late Margaret Sangster, if I had known in the morning, how wearily all the day, the words unkind would trouble my mind, that I said when you went away, I had been more careful, darling. Nor given you needless pain, but we vex our own with look and tone, we may never take back again. For though in the quiet evening, you may give me the kiss of peace, yet it well might be that never for me, the pain of the heart should cease. How many go forth at morning, who never come home at night? And hearts have broken for harsh words spoken, that sorrow can ne'er set right. We have careful thought for the stranger, and smiles for the sometime guest, but oft for, our own, the bitter tone, though we love our own the best. Ah! Lips with the curve impatient, ah! Brow with the shade of scorn, t'were a cruel fate, were the night too late, to undo the work of the morn. You have been the best mother in the world, cried a son to his mother on her deathbed. 
She was a widow who had struggled hard to support her son. She took in washing and did scrubbing in order to send him to college, but this was the first time that her son had ever told her that she had been a good mother. She turned her dying eyes upon him and said, Why didn't you say so before, John? Think what it would have meant to this poor, hard-working mother if her son had only shown his love and appreciation for her during her lifetime. How it would have brightened up her long, weary years. If folks could have their funerals when they are alive and well and struggling along, what a help it would be. Sighed Mrs. Perkins, upon returning from a funeral, wondering how poor Mrs. Brown would have felt if she could have heard what the minister said. Poor soul, she never dreamed they set so much by her. Ms. Brown got discouraged. Ye see, Deacon Brown, he'd got a way of blaming everything on to her. I don't suppose the deacon meant it, twas just his way, but it's awful wearing. When things wore out or broke, he acted just as if Ms. Brown did it herself on purpose, and they all caught it, like the measles or the whooping cough. Just think of what a woman who has a half dozen children has to endure if she is obliged to do all her work, sewing, cooking, washing, and cleaning, without even the assistance of a hired girl. How long could a man stand this kind of an existence, shut up in a house or a little flat year in and year out, rarely ever going anywhere, with very little variety or change? How would he keep his cheer? A few days of confinement in the home is about all most men can stand, especially if their rest is disturbed at night by sick children. Most men little realize how rapidly a woman fades and uses herself up and loses her cheer when she works like a slave all day and long into the night, caring for a large family. Just because a wife is willing to do everything she can to help her husband, is no reason why he should allow her to ruin her health and attractiveness, rob her of the zest for living, in the operation. There is nothing more wearing and exasperating, nothing which will grind life away more rapidly than monotonous, exacting housework. A man has a great variety during the day in his business, but his wife slaves at home and rarely gets any variety. How is she to keep joy in the home for the children, or for guests and friends? She is plodding and digging all day long, year in and year out, cleaning, scrubbing, mending clothes, caring for the children, a work which grinds life away rapidly, because of the drudgery and monotony of it. The husband has constant change which rests and refreshes him, but to the average wife it is one dull, monotonous routine of hard, exacting, exasperating toil. And yet the wife and mother should be the fountainhead of joy in the home. Many a man is cross and crabbed when he comes home, just because his wife is not quite as buoyant and cheerful and entertaining as he thinks she ought to be after a nerve-wracking, exacting day's work. What does he do to make the evening pleasant for her? How many times during the last year has he taken his wife out to entertainments or to dinner? When did he last take her away on a little trip? How long has it been since he brought her home some flowers, confectionery, a book, or some other little gift which would tell her that he was thoughtful of her? How often has he given up his club, or the society of his companions, or his own pleasure to remain home and help his wife take care of the children, or make the evening delightful for his family? The home has the misfortune of being a place where all the tired, cross, exhausted, played-out members of the family meet at night, often after a trying, perplexing day's work. The children are cross and tired from school or play, things have gone wrong with the father, there has been discord and trouble in the office, store, or factory. He has seen merchandise spoiled, broken, misdirected, by indifferent, blundering, careless employees. His partners were cross and crabbed because they started out wrong in the morning with disputes, friction at home. Poor business, tight money, ever-increasing competition, all these things focus upon the father during the day, and totally unfit him to contribute his part towards the ideal home life in the evening. 
In addition to all this, the husband does not feel the same restraint in the home. He has managed to be half decent during the daytime, because so many eyes were watching him, his pride and vanity have kept him from making a fool of himself before others. But when he gets home, under his own roof, he asks himself, why shouldn't he throw off his restraint and do as he feels like doing, making a kicking post of his home, making it unpleasant for everybody? Saving only the dregs for the home, exasperated nerves and jaded energies, is a very short-sighted policy. Thousands of homes in this country are made up of shreds and patches. All we find there is the byproduct of a man's occupation. Many a man gives the home what he has left over, the crumbs, the odds and ends. Instead of bringing to it his freshest energies, his buoyant spirits, he often comes a physical wreck. He remains in the store or office as long as there is anything left of him that is any good. Then he goes home, and he wonders why the children avoid him, why they do not run and throw their arms about his neck, delighted to see him. The children know that when such a father reaches home their fun is pretty nearly over. They do not see anything very interesting or attractive in his long, tired face. Of course there is no spring in his dragging, hesitating steps. They know there is no vitality left for a romp with them on the floor or on the lawn. They know they have to keep quiet or they will be sent to bed or out of the room. Make the meal time an occasion to be looked forward to by every member of the family for a good time, for hearty laughter, and for bright, entertaining conversation. Train the children to bring their best moods and to say their brightest and best things at the table. If this practice were generally put in force it would revolutionize American homes and drive the doctors to despair. With some families joking and funny story telling at meals has become such an established feature that it is a real joy to dine with them. The dinner hour is sure to afford a jolly good time. There is a rivalry among the members to see who can say the brightest, wittiest thing, or tell the best story. There is no dyspepsia, no nagging in such a family. Make a business of having a good time after dinner or after supper and during your holidays. Let your presence in the home be a signal to the children for a romp and a play and a good time generally. Just make up your mind that you are going to make your home the happiest place on earth, so happy and so attractive that your children will prefer spending an evening there to going anywhere else. Do not be afraid of a little noise, or of a little scratched or broken furniture now and then. This is infinitely better than stunted childhood, dyspepsia, and doctor's bills. The growth of many a child has been starved and stunted to save a little furniture, bric-a-brac, or clothing. The average modern man has taken the cream off his energies during the daytime, and brings home only the skimmed milk, and this is often very sour. Then he wonders why his wife is not as bright and as agreeable as she used to be. He cannot see the poor, mean, miserable, starved part of himself that he brings to her, and he expects her to match it all with the same charm and sweetness, the same joyous response that she gave him when he brought the best part of himself to her. His weariness and depression cannot summon forth that happy response, they paralyze the children's play, they strangle the home joy. Chapter 9 the power of the home joy. Over the roofs of the village columns of pale blue smoke, like clouds of incense ascending, rose from a hundred hearths, the homes of peace and contentment. There the richest was poor, and the poorest lived in abundance. Signed, Longfellow. Some of the happiest homes I have ever known, ideal homes, where intelligence, peace, and harmony dwell, have been homes of poor people. No rich carpets covered the floors, there were no costly paintings on the walls, no piano, no library, no works of art. But there were contented minds, devoted and unselfish lives, each contributing as much as possible to the happiness of all, 
and endeavoring to compensate by intelligence and kindness for the poverty of their surroundings. What a pitiable sight to see a man struggling with all his might to pile up a big fortune, and yet utterly neglecting the very thing for which he was born self-enlargement and happiness shared with wife and children. Gold can buy and furnish houses but no money ever yet bought or made a home, yet what wealth of tenderness, of self-sacrifice, of kindliness, of peace have transformed the humblest dwellings into treasure houses of the heart. A young husband should remember that a woman sacrifices infinitely more for the man she loves than he does for her, and he should study to prevent early disappointments. If both husband and wife could do this for one another, the divorce courts would be without business. Men often think that they are superior to their wives because they are the family providers, that it requires superior ability to earn money. As a fact much of their success is due to the wife's influence, due to her tact and ability to keep her home happy and her husband in good working trim, to keep him from worrying, to keep him from dissipation, and all sorts of things which, but for her, might cripple his earning capacity and lower his efficiency. Most men are much saner, much more normal and level-headed, economical and careful, on account of their wives. A model home is a great corrective for a man. It keeps him up to standard, and saves him from getting blue and discouraged. It develops the affectionate side of his nature and renders his character stronger and more symmetrical. Men can produce very much more because of harmony and affection in the home. I have known and know now many women who claim nothing and who get no credit from the world, who are, nonetheless, the real brains behind a statesman's reputation. And there are others who assist their husbands in such secrecy that the fact that they are helping is hidden, even from the husband. Someone has said that marriage is an episode in the life of a man, an epoch in the life of a woman. Many men are not so firmly attached to their wives by their affection as their wives are to them. A devoted wife is apt to overlook a man's weaknesses. She does not realize that his love is more easily detached than hers, and that the same things which she was so particular about before marriage are the very things that will hold him after marriage, that these are her magic and her power. Man does not love in the same way as a woman does. There is more selfishness in his affection. When a good woman has given her love it is for all time, and her love is less selfish and her devotion is not as dependent upon the man's attractiveness as is his for her. It is true that married women often make the fatal mistake of not making themselves attractive in every possible way after marriage as they did before. They think that they can hold their husband's love and admiration upon their real worth, regardless of their personal charms, dress, or appearance. If you are disappointed in your life partner examine yourself and see if you are not partly at fault. There is no encouragement to a woman to fix herself up prettily for a man who never looks at her, and never notices what she has on or how her hair is arranged, unless it be to criticize it unfavorably. It is not easy for a woman to be bright and entertaining when she talks to a man who merely grunts or scowls in reply. Single-handed and alone she cannot make the home joy. Why should you speak to your wife in a tone of voice that you would not dare to use toward another woman? Try the praise plan, the appreciation plan, for a while. Give up fault-finding. Praise is a heart stimulant. Blame is a heart depressant, says Dorothy Dix. Ella Wheeler Wilcox says. If you knew your marital partner would be dead a year from today, how would you conduct yourself for the next 12 months? Would you lose your temper over trifles, and spoil your own and another's comfort because there was a late meal, or a mistake about the time or place you were to meet each other, and would you nag and irritate and antagonize the one you are bound to for life? I am sure you would not. You would be very considerate and patient and kind, knowing the face you looked upon was so soon to be hidden from your sight, the voice you listened to so soon to be stilled. You would think of all that man's or woman's virtues, 
you would recall all the early days of courtship, and you would make the same excuses for shortcomings you did in that romantic era. Why not use the same forbearance, affection, and courtesy toward the man or woman who is liable to live 20 years as toward one who is to die very soon? If people are properly mated, the real romance begins with marriage. The majority of men do not realize how little it takes to make a woman happy. She will put up with most everything, poverty and all sorts of hardships and make a cozy, comfortable home out of any kind of a hearth if her affections are satisfied. But if her heart is not fed, she will wither, and the best thing will die out of her, even though she live in a palace and be surrounded with regal luxuries. No amount of money will compensate a true woman for the lack of affection and appreciation expressed by her husband in a multitude of little attentions and considerations. It should be the great aim of young married people to keep the commonplace out of their lives and maintain not only love, but the expression of it in a hundred delicate, winning ways. In happiness at home lies the strength of both. Not sentiment alone but practical adjustments will count for harmony and satisfaction. A level-headed husband should try to avoid every possible means of friction, and there is no better way of avoiding a large part of it, than by forming an actual partnership in which the wife runs the household in her own way, just the same as he runs his business without the wife's interference. The home should be regarded as the wife's, and she should manage it to suit herself. If she wishes to ask her husband's advice, all well and good, but there should be an understanding that the home is absolutely the wife's domain, that it is under her exclusive control, and she should be made to feel as independent in her realm, as the husband is in his. A great deal of the friction in the average home centers around financial matters, and could be avoided by a simple, definite understanding, and a business arrangement about household finances. As a rule, it is a very rare man who can spend money for the home so wisely and with as good taste as can the wife. Fortunately it is becoming more and more customary for men to allow their wives a certain proportion of the income every week or month, and to let them run the household as they see fit, and pay all the expenses without any question being asked as to where the money went to. The wife pays the provision bills, the servant's salaries, buys the clothing for the family and pays her own personal expenses. No questions are asked. She will delight in her independence. Disputes are not as liable to arise as when money is doled out to the wife by piecemeal. When freedom and joy are the wife's share, they become the children's heritage. A happy childhood is an imperative preparation for a happy maturity. Most homes are far too serious. Why not let the children dance and play to their heart's content? They will get rubs enough, knocks enough in the world, they will get enough of the hard side of life later. Resolve that they shall at least be just as happy as you can make them while at home, so that if they should have unfortunate experiences later, they can look back upon their home as a sweet, beautiful, charming oasis in their life the happiest spot on earth. It is a great thing to encourage fun in the home. There is nothing like a fun-loving home. It keeps children off the streets, it discourages vice and all that is morbid. The home ought to be a sort of theater for fun and all sorts of sports, a place where the children should take the active parts, although the parents should come in for a share too. You will find that a little fun in the evening, romping, and playing with the children, will make you sleep better. It will clear the physical cobwebs and brain ash from your mind. You will be fresher and brighter for it the next day. You will be surprised to see how much more work you can do, and how much more readily you can do it if you try to have all the innocent fun you can. We have all felt the wonderful bomb, the great uplift, the refreshment, the rejuvenation which have come from a jolly good time with family or friends, when we have come home after a hard, exacting day's work, when our bodies were jaded and we were brain-weary and exhausted. 
What magic a single hour's fun will often work in a tired soul. Have music in the home. Music tends to restore and preserve the mental harmony. Nervous diseases are wonderfully helped by good music. It keeps one's mind off his troubles, and gives nature a chance to heal all sorts of mental discords. Music gives a soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, a charm to sadness, gaiety and life to everything. It is the essence of order, and leads to all that is good, just, and beautiful, says Plato. Happiness should begin in the home. The family gathering around the table for the evening meal should be one of chat and cheerfulness. Swallow a lot of fun with your meals. The practice is splendid. It is the best thing in the world for your health. It is better than swallowing dyspepsia with every mouthful of food. The meal time ought to be looked forward to by every member of the family as an occasion for a good time, for hearty laughter, and for bright, entertaining conversation. The children should be trained to bring their best moods and say their brightest and best things at the table. If this practice were put in force it would revolutionize American homes and drive the doctors to despair. Who could estimate what civilization owes to man's dream of a happy home of his own? What an incentive to man in all ages has been this vision of a home of his own. It is this picture which holds the youth to his task, buoys him up in times of hardship and discouragement. This picture of a home, this vision of a little cottage and some fair maiden waiting at the door this home vision has ever been the great incentive of the struggler, the greatest incentive of mankind. It is the dream of, a home of my own, that has lifted multitudes of youths out of obscurity. There is no spur on earth which has had anything like the influence over man that this home vision has. The thought of his home and wife and children, dearer to him than life, keeps vast multitudes of men grinding away at their dreary tasks, when they see no other light in the distance. To multitudes of people home is the only oasis in their desert life. What will men not do for the sake of the home? They cross oceans, they explore continents. They endure the heat of the tropics and the cold of the arctics, they explore mines in the wilderness, cut themselves off from civilization for years for the sake of the home. Home is the sweetest word in the language. It has ever been the favorite theme of the poet, the author, and the artist. History is packed with the achievements of men for the sake of the home. The inventor, the discoverer, in all ages has been sacrificed for the home. Half the misery in the world would be avoided if people would make a business of having plenty of fun at home, instead of running everywhere else in search of it. There is an irrepressible longing for amusement, for rollicking fun, in young people, and if these longings were more fully met in the home it would not be so difficult to keep the boy and girl under the parental roof. I always think there is something wrong when the father or the children are so very uneasy to get out of the house at night and to go off, somewhere, where they will have a good time. A happy, joyous home is a powerful magnet to child and man. The sacred memory of it has kept many a person from losing his self-respect, and from the commission of crime. Fun is the cheapest and best medicine in the world for your children as well as for yourself. Give it to them in good large doses. It will not only save you doctor's bills, but it will also help to make your children happier, and will improve their chances in life. We should not need half so many prisons, insane asylums, and almshouses if all children had a happy childhood. Now for rest and happiness. No business troubles allowed here. These are true home building mottos. The home joy is the greatest power for good in the world. Chapter 10, The Dangers of Thwarted Ambition I hold it the duty of one who is gifted, and specially dowered in all men's sight, to know no rest till his life is lifted, 
fully up to his great gift's height. How often we see a bright, enthusiastic, ambitious girl, with a passion for music, and great talent, marry a businessman, and become buried in a home. Her husband may love her deeply, but he may not have the least sympathy with or appreciation of his wife's special talent, or even the slightest interest in it. If, after a while, she begins to fade, and becomes depressed and despondent, he may think that a change, a trip abroad, or a better home will restore her cheerfulness, her charm. But they do not. There is still a great hunger for which she has had practically no food, a starvation going on in her nature, which no amount of change or money will satisfy, for there is something within us which does not feed upon money or anything that we can buy. There is a gradual shriveling, a pitiful shrinking, going on in her, a great decline of values all along the line. Everywhere we see people who have prematurely gone to seed. They seem to have no special zest in life, no great enthusiasm for anything, there is a great disappointment somewhere in their lives. Why are they so unhappy? No one loses his interest in life, or becomes indifferent to his work unless he has been thwarted in the carrying out of his ambition or for some other reason has been unable to find his right place in life. Wherever we see discontent, unhappiness, unrest, we may be sure that the person exhibiting these conditions has not found his niche or has not been able to carry out his ambition. For some reason his heart had been cheated of its ideal. Women have a marvelous way of hiding their griefs, covering up their disappointments, but such disappointment may mar a whole life. A man, under such circumstances, would rebel, but women often suffer in silence while they smother their ambition. Who can ever estimate the terrible tragedies that are being enacted in the hearts of thousands who are suffering agonies from gnawing, unsatisfied longings, but who are compelled to do the thing which they loathe because somebody else is dependent upon them, because poor invalid brothers or sisters chain them to it, and there is no possibility of escape. Like a caged eagle beating against his prison bars the pinions which were intended to lift him into the ether, they chafe against restraint, they swallow the great lump which rises in their throats, and suffer on. How many of those whom we criticize and denounce may be undergoing constant pain from just such limitations, through imagined or real imprisonment of talent? If there is anything pitiable in this world, it is a person tormented by a great ambition which cannot be satisfied. To feel a gnawing hunger for that which one can never possess is suffering indeed. To have no chance, to see no opening to do that which we yearn to do, is one of the inexplicable problems of life. It is hard to bear pain and suffer disappointment when we are doing that which we feel we were fitted for, but it takes heroic qualities to suffer in silence, to endure with patience, to work on faithfully, when the heart has been cheated of its ideal, the ambition disappointed, and hope has gone out of the life. We long for freedom, we want to soar, to try the wings God gave us, yet we are losing our power because we do not, cannot, exercise it. We are wasting life, losing strength in petty pursuits and enslaving drudgery. There is no suffering, except remorse, so fatal as that which comes from the consciousness of strangled ambition, blasted hope, stifled aspiration. To be conscious that we possess decided ability for some particular calling, and to be compelled by circumstances, year after year, to be chained to drudgery which the heart loathes, requires supreme courage. To feel that there is no probability, or even possibility, of ever being able to express that great hungry longing, pent up in the heart, filling it almost to bursting, to drag through the weary years trying to be cheerful and hopeful and helpful to those we love, and yet to feel that our devotion to them has made the other thing impossible to us, to suffer in silence disappointment which makes the heart sick, is the greatest test of real manhood, of womanhood. It is easy for us to criticize other people who have not risen in the world, as perhaps we have, but they may be heroes compared with us. 
We can never tell what tragedies may be going on in their hearts, or from what tortures of disappointed ambition and blasted hopes they may be suffering. To be compelled to go through life without any possibility of satisfying the great soul hunger, of realizing the infinite longings of the heart, is torture. There is no compensation for this except from the sense of duty done to others who would have suffered, had we tried to realize our ambition. And yet, may it not be that we ourselves are in some measure to blame? Have we kept alive the soul, the core, the essence of our ambition? The greatest of all victories is the victory which is wrung from apparent defeat. Cling to your ideal. When one stifles his ambition, lets his greatest talent die within him, his whole nature may be perverted, he becomes susceptible to all sorts of temptations, and sometimes even develops criminal tendencies. The following out of our strongest bent is our greatest safeguard. It makes us more contented, steadies our aim, and tends to make the whole life normal. But no one is safe when for any reason he ceases to pursue his great passion, his highest ambition. It takes a strong character to enable a man to stand firm and true, unless he is following his bent, or at least approximating it. There is something in the pursuit of the highest ambition, in full, complete self-expression, which satisfies the whole nature. It is to the individual what a family is to the young husband, it is a balance wheel, it steadies his movements, makes him more contented and dignifies his whole being. When a man is doing the work he loves he is safe from a thousand temptations which, but for it, would be likely to entice him into all sorts of things which would injure, and perhaps ruin, him. Man was made for action. The mind must be employed, and when it is employed normally it gives a great sense of satisfaction, and increases health. The individual feels the exhilaration of constant growth, and there is no stimulant like that. It gives an uplift to the entire nature. There is no tonic, no stimulant, like that of the successful pursuit of one's highest ambition. Everywhere we see people crippled, dwarfed, emasculated, because they have been denied the pursuit of their supreme ambition. In it they would be giants, outside of it they are pygmies. There is something so utterly discouraging, disheartening, in being forced to give up the careers they long for, that the nature never entirely rallies from the shock. Everywhere we see these burned out shells of individuals who have been robbed of their normal pursuit. They are ambitionless, restless, ineffective weaklings, mere pygmies of their possible selves. To be conscious of having fine ability, but being powerless to use it, to feel oneself getting on in years without getting on in life, to feel the years slipping by, one by one, without any corresponding results from one's effort, to feel that the very material from which a successful life can be made is gradually drifting beyond our grasp, to reach middle life or later without having made good, and yet to feel ambition prodding and spurring us on, and conscience upbraiding us for not seizing. The opportunities that we let slip through our fingers, to see the chance and yet to be so paralyzed that we cannot grasp it, to be conscious that we are going down the decline towards the sunset of life, with nothing to show for the misspent years, for all the ineffective years, this is agony indeed. There is nothing so important in life as to get into the right place. Then we need no spurring, no goading on, for the exhilaration and tonic which comes from the normal exercise of our highest faculties will itself hold us to our task. The love of our work is the greatest incentive. No great work is ever done from compulsion. If there is no heart in it, it lacks fife, force, everything. The consciousness that we cannot deliver the message which runs in the blood, that the thing which we have set our heart on and the thing which our ambition craves cannot be realized, causes intense suffering, and premature old age. To be conscious that we have the power, the ability to do some one thing superbly well, to feel that all our ability and inclination point to that one possible goal, and then to have it all thwarted, 
to be conscious that we must get our living by our weakness instead of by our strength, because of something we cannot control, makes the heart sick and the hair gray. A thwarted ambition seems to wrench the whole nature out of its normal orbit. Everything seems perverted when we cannot do that which we are able to do the easiest and best. Everyone is conscious that he was made to fit perfectly the work for which he was intended, and that anything else will be a misfit. It is very easy to say that man is an adaptable creature and can adjust himself to conditions which confront him. Of course, a man can do something in a work he is not fitted for, but he cannot do it superbly well, with that zest and enthusiasm which are characteristic of excellency. He cannot find in it satisfaction. The human mind is happiest and it is most active in performing the functions which it was intended to perform. One of man's greatest passions is that of achievement, the passion for doing things, the ambition to accomplish. This is one of the greatest satisfactions of life, and satisfaction is the chief ingredient in happiness. The consciousness of growth, which increases one's power, is one of the durable satisfactions of life. The love of achievement is satisfied in the very act of creation, in the realization of the ideal which has haunted the brain. Ease, leisure, Comfort are nothing compared with the exhilaration which comes from achievement. Who can describe the sense of triumph that fills the inventor, the joy that thrills him when he sees for the first time the perfect mechanism or device, the work of his brain and hand, that will ameliorate the hard conditions of mankind and help to emancipate man from drudgery? Who can imagine the satisfaction, the happiness, of the scientist who, after years of battling with poverty, criticism, and denunciation, and the tortures of being misunderstood by those dearest to him, succeeds at last in wresting some great secret from nature, in making some marvelous discovery that will push civilization forward. The exercise of the creative faculties, the stretching of the mind over greater and greater problems, and the solving of them, constitute a powerful mental tonic and give a satisfaction which nothing else gives. Think of the tameness, the insipidity, the weakness, the mental flabbiness of the life of the inactive and purposeless man who has nothing special to do, no great life motive pushing him on, in comparison with that of the man who feels all the forces within him heaving and tugging away to accomplish a mighty purpose. The idle, aimless man does not know the meaning of personal power or the satisfaction and joy which comes to the doer, the achiever. We have an instinctive feeling that we have been set in motion by a higher power, that there is an invisible spring within us the imperious must, which impels us to weave the pattern given us in the mount of transfiguration of our highest moment, to make our life vision real. A divine impulse constantly urges us to reach our highest ideal. There is something back of our supreme ambition deeper than a mere personal gratification. There is a vital connection between it and the great plan of creation, the progress, the final goal, of the race. Chapter 11 An Idle Life An Unhappy Life in idleness alone is their perpetual despair. Signed, Carlyle. The Shah of Persia gazed in wonder at English ladies and gentlemen dancing. Can they not hire persons to do it for them? He said. He supposed that to look at dancing was more pleasurable than to dance. We think the pleasure of life is in receiving sensations the most. Limited idea says Charlotte Perkins Gilman. The main pleasures of life come through expression rather than impression. It is more pleasant to paint a picture than to look at it, to sing than to hear singing. Supplied with every conceivable means of gratification, a human being soon exhausts the pleasure of having things, but given right avenues to employ his energies, he never exhausts the pleasure of doing things. The receiving power of an organism is not so great as its giving power. Expression is greater than impression. We fondly imagine that it is better to have things than do them, 
an error carried to its natural height when acting under this mistake we seek to avoid work and look down upon the worker. If all of the results of the workers of the world their discoveries, their inventions, their railroads, their steamships, their telephones, and all of the facilities which they have produced, if all traces of the workers' efforts were suddenly withdrawn from this earth, and we were living at the mercy of the idlers, who would care to remain here? What a dismal sort of a world this would be. It is work that keeps the human race in health, in contentment, in prosperity. A. Man's task is his life preserver, as well as his most potent worry eliminator. I do not believe that it is possible for any able-bodied human being to be happy who lives an idle, purposeless life. It is not natural for the human machinery to remain idle. There are a thousand indications in a man's economy that he was made for work, for strong vigorous action. Happiness comes from the normal exercise of our faculties, and whatever faculty or function is not exercised tends to deteriorate. Whatever is idle, except for rest and recuperation, is on the way to oblivion. Man is naturally a just being, and the universal sense of justice, of fairness, is outraged when he refuses to do his part in the world's work. One of the most discouraging phases of our modern life is the large and ever-increasing number of people who have no serious purpose in life but to spend their time turning money into nothing, nothing that counts, nothing that is worthwhile. Their principal occupation is chasing after pleasure, and of course they are disappointed and discontented. Happiness is a product which comes from doing things worthwhile, from making oneself useful to the world, in doing one's share of the world's work. It is impossible for an habitually idle rich person to be really happy, because he is all the time conscious of that inferiority which inevitably comes from unused faculties. Deterioration is the law written upon everything that is not in active use. How quickly a farm, a building, or a machine will deteriorate when unoccupied, unused. Things which are not serving any real purpose nature takes hack to the elements from which they came. The really happy person, therefore, must not only be active but he must also be conscious of doing his level best, otherwise the sense of self-reproval, self-reproach, will mar his happiness. There certainly is a great satisfaction in achievement, in doing things, which is never experienced in an idle life. Idle people, either rich or poor, if they are able to work, are always unhappy, discontented, dissatisfied. They flit about from one thing to another, and from place to place, in their vain effort to find something which will satisfy them. No man can be happy who is not willing to do his part in the world's work, who expects to take out of life's great granary all of the good things which the world's workers have put there, with no adequate compensation on his part. One of the principal constituents of happiness is honesty, and no one is honest who does not work according to his strength. I have seen rich young men who never did an honest day's work in their lives, never earned enough to buy a suit of clothes, and I have heard them tell what a bore it is to travel, how they are wearied with going through the art galleries. Why, some of these idlers are tired of living. Life loses its zest to the idlers. They do not get the real flavor of life, which comes from the consciousness of doing one's part in the world's work, doing one's level best and making life worthwhile. How much more we enjoy money which we have earned by hard work than that which we inherit, which we get without effort. We are so constituted that we cannot really enjoy what we do not earn. What we achieve by our own effort, our own initiative, becomes a part of our very being. The idler does not enjoy a day's outing as does the man who works hard, who feels that he has earned his recreation, then it means something to him, every minute of it is a joy. There is only one price for real happiness, the satisfaction of holding one's head up and looking the world in the face. Happiness must be purchased with honest personal endeavor, with earnest effort to do one's share of the world's work. 
If we refuse to pay this price we cannot expect its blessings. The time will come when human drones will be ostracized from society as nobodies, as thieves of honest men's efforts, thieves of the results of honest men's labor. The coming civilization will not tolerate these thieves of society, these lazy vagabonds who do nothing but steal the products of their labor and demoralize society by their vicious example. The lazy, indolent, idle man cannot respect himself, for there is something inside of him that tells him that he is a thief, tells him that it is unfair, cowardly, to expect that others will be the slave of his desires, that he shall have all of the good things of life and live in idleness, while they who do all the work have almost no pleasures and are not even able to live as human beings ought to live. Do not flatter yourself that you can be really happy unless you are useful. Happiness and usefulness were born twins. To separate them is fatal. It is as impossible for a human being to be happy who is habitually idle as it is for a fine chronometer to be normal when not running. Happiness is incompatible with stagnation. A man must feel his expanding power lifting, tugging away at a lofty purpose, or B will miss the joy of living. The chief reason why a retired man is usually unhappy and discontented is because of his consciousness of deterioration, of a cessation of vigorous activity, he has a growing sense of inferior thinking and production. And when a man ceases to do things, he soon loses his confidence that he can do them. There is no place in the universe for the idler, everything was planned and fitted for the dead and earnest worker. The best evidence that the idler is out of place everywhere is that he fits in nowhere. Nature begins to take away from him what he has because he does not use it. He is left empty-handed, helpless, miserable. Chapter 12, Joy in Our Work Work is the best thing to make us love life. Signed, Ernest Renat. The man who works is the happy man. It make all the difference in the world to our health and happiness whether we look upon our work as drudgery or whether we do it with delight. Work should be a tonic, not a grind, life a delight, not a struggle. Work, regarded by many as the curse sent upon man for sin, is instead God's highway to the hills of happiness. Not drudgery, but blessed employment which brings all the activities into play and gives a zest to recreation. Work is man's greatest blessing, for an occupied mind is not a tempted mind, and it is a double blessing to the weak-minded. Vast multitudes of people have been saved from useless, dissipated lives by being obliged to work. A vocation is not only a tremendous educator, a developer, a strengthener of all our faculties, but this systematic, constant exercise of our faculties, gives us perpetual pleasure and is a great character builder, and protector. It is the law of nature that anything that is not helpfully occupied begins to deteriorate, to go to pieces. It matters not whether it is an engine or a human brain, exercise or deteriorate is the law of life. Perhaps the majority of active men have lost their freshness and buoyancy of spirit in their work, have lost their mental elasticity, and they work in a mechanical, perfunctory way. They regard their work as more or less of a misfortune or a drudgery from which they would like to get away, and from which they expect to be released when they get a little farther along, a little higher up. Most people are looking and hoping for release from work, and yet all history and all experience prove that busy people, people who are constantly occupied, are the happiest. In fact, idleness is a great human curse. It is an absolute foe of happiness. No idle man or woman has any comprehension of the word. The most unhappy person in the world is the one without employment, no amount of money can take the place of work. Man must work. That is certain as the sun. But he may work grudgingly or he may work gratefully, he may work as a man, or he may work as a machine. He cannot always choose his work, but he can do it in a generous temper, 
and with an uplooking heart. There is no work so rude that he may not breathe a soul into it, there is no work so dull, that he may not enliven it. God never meant labor to be a drudgery, he meant it to be a pleasure, and we find that it is so in business houses where moral sunshine, harmony, and good will prevail. It is in such places that we also find the best work done, best both in quality and in quantity. A contented mind, a cheerful disposition are the best kind of capital and pay big dividends. If you and those about you are cheerful and happy, business will come to you, you will attract it. We should take it for granted that no life can be entirely free from vexations, trials, troubles, sorrows, and disappointments, but we should resolve that these things shall not be allowed to disturb our peace of mind, or to destroy our happiness. It is as amazing as it is sad, that we go about largely burdening ourselves with strivings that are of no consequence, and miss the gladness and exhilaration of living. No life is successful until it is radiant with happiness. No matter what your business may be, if you are an employer, you will find that no investment you can make will pay you so well as the effort to scatter heart sunshine through your establishment. Scolding, fault-finding, criticizing, and slave-driving methods have been tried in every business from the beginning of time and have proved total failures. Many a man has strangled his business by his harsh, brutal treatment of his employees. He has crushed hope out of the most buoyant, strangled enthusiasm, killed spontaneity, and made service for every one in his establishment a dreary drudgery instead of a delight. Many businessmen are beginning to discover that it pays not only to make employees comfortable but happy. They are finding that this is the best kind of an investment. Men can produce more, they are more efficient, they do their best work when happiest. Our mental attitude has everything to do with our productiveness. Our brains do not work properly, our faculties will not give up their best when the mind is discordant, troubled. If you are an employer, do not go about your place of business as though you thought life were a wretched, miserable grind. Show yourself master of the situation, not its slave. Rise above the petty annoyances which destroy peace and harmony. Make up your mind that you are too large to be overcome by trifles. Resolve that you will be larger than your business, that you will overtop it with your manliness and cheerfulness. To say nothing of its being your duty to make the lives of those who are helping you to carry on your business as pleasant and as full of sunshine as possible, it is the best possible policy for you to pursue. You know very well that a horse that is prodded and fretted and urged all the time by means of whip and spur and rein, will not travel nearly so far without becoming exhausted as one that is urged forward by gentleness and kind treatment. In their susceptibility to kindness, men and women are in no wise different from the lower animals. You cannot expect your employees to remain buoyant, cheerful, alert, and unwearied under the goad of scowls and the lash of a bitter tongue. Energy is only another name for enthusiasm, and how can you expect those who work for you to be enthusiastic or energetic in your service when surrounded by an atmosphere of despondency and gloom, when they expect a volley of curses and criticism every time you pass? There is no other one thing that will contribute so much to the life that is worth while as the optimistic habit. The habit of carrying a cheerful, hopeful, optimistic outlook upon life tends to light up one's pathway. Optimism is a grand creed. You can adopt no better life philosophy. The habit of looking for the best in our work, and of seeing the best in everybody and everything is of untold value. It is the sign of a sane, healthy mind. I have found my greatest happiness in labor said Gladstone. I early formed a habit of industry, and it has been its own reward. Many people are pessimistic because they see no consistency or relationship between what people call the dry, dreary drudgery of life and the idea that life was intended to be a joy, a perpetual delight. 
They cannot see any relation between a perpetual delight in hard work, disagreeable duties. They are unable, unlike the bee, to extract honey from the bitter flowers of life. To them labor, everything that seems a drudgery, is a curse. The trouble is, many of us are tempted to overwork. We strain to do more than we are able. Do not undertake more than you can accomplish says Dr. Thomas Slicer. The unhappiness of life lies in the fret of it, not in its work, but in its worry. Good, strong well-ordered work never killed a man, but the worry of it, the loading up of an hour with two hours work, the loading up of an evening with too many engagements, being avaricious of pleasure and greedy of delight, will make us unhappy. Joy ceases to be joy when it is not conveniently handled and easily carried. The training, the discipline, the carrying out of the great life motive are the chief objects of labor. The Creator could have spared man physical labor, but he would not have been a developed man. Every nerve and every muscle, every fiber, every cell in our body, cries out for exercise, for work. The eye wants work, the ear wants work, the perceptions want work, every faculty of the mind calls for healthful exercise. The perfect heaven which the old theologians and many people once pictured for themselves, would, in reality, make a hell for active, thinking people. What would we do in a place where the streets were paved with gold, the walls made of glass, and where there was perpetual rest? Every cell in our brain calls for activity, and existence in a place where the faculties were lulled to rest would be torture to normal human beings. Man is so constituted that he must be happiest when he is conscious that he is the most active in useful work. The best thing that will ever come to a human being will come from his daily task, come in the ordinary pursuit of his vocation. The extraordinary things come to us very seldom. One's daily life is where he uses his religion, his philosophy. This is the test of his quality, the measure of the man, the spirit in which he works and how he bears his daily task. There is no one thing that has ever done so much for humanity, that has saved so many human beings from despair, has kept so many from suicide, no one thing that has called forth other resources, developed and strengthened other powers of mind and body as has hard work. It is unaccountable that anything which has been such a wonderful benefit to mankind as work has proved to be, should be loathed, despised, dreaded by so many people. Miss Alma Tadima, in her lecture on, What is Happiness? said it took her five months to write down the definition of happiness. She says that happiness is the result of working hard and developing one's powers to the limit. She does not believe that it is possible for a person to be very happy while he is conscious that he is developing only a small percentage of his possible ability. His happiness would be of a very low order because there would be a perpetual reprimand in him which would take the edge from his happiness if he were not doing his best to give his best to the world. What a joy there is in an exquisitely done job, a piece of work that is done to the complete finish, that has our unqualified approval, that makes us respect ourselves more. Owing to ingrained habits, said Horace Mann, work has always been to me what water is to a fish. There can be no greater happiness than the normal, vigorous exercise of one's faculties along the line of his bent. Life means little without a purpose. Once his life aim is lost, man simply exists he does not really live. I have yet to see a human being wretched while busily occupied along the line of his talent. What can give better satisfaction than a sense of mastery in our undertakings, a consciousness of the ability to do things that are different from others about us, with consummate ease? The exercise which comes from our work, moreover, gives an enjoyment according to the kind and quality of the faculties that are called into action in the operation. If the benevolent faculties, the unselfish faculties are called into play, we get a much higher form of enjoyment, than when the greedy, selfish faculties are exercised. 
There is every indication in the nature of things that it was intended that man should find his greatest happiness, his great satisfaction in life, his chief joy, in his daily occupation. Other things we enjoy now and then, occasionally, but if we love our work we have a perpetual feast. The satisfaction of the happiness which comes from travel, from viewing works of art, from reading a book, from social intercourse with friends, from the opera, from the theater, is a temporary thing in our life, but the man who loves his work has a daily enjoyment. Most people merely exist, they do not really live. A man's vocation should be his joy, he should put his soul into it and find his delight in it. The conscious self-expression of ourselves, the exercise of our powers and faculties should give constant satisfaction. Merely to grind out a day's work, because we have to do it, to work under pressure, is not living. If we are perfectly normal we should go to our work in the morning with that keen delight and anticipation that a prospective bride and bridegroom feel on the approach of their wedding day. What glorious pictures of anticipation a young, ambitious artist feels. He can scarcely wait until he can return to his half-finished picture which has haunted him since he left it the night before. What a revolution in business there would be if employees in great establishments approached their work every morning with that supreme zest, with that glorious anticipation of a Michelangelo or a Millet. With what keen delight does the young author go to his half-finished book, to take up again the characters which have robbed him of sleep and which have filled his vision through waking hours since he left it the night before. Everyone ought to go to his work in the morning with a similar zest, with the anticipated joy that can scarcely wait until the store, the factory, or the studio opens in the morning. It would not be long before multitudes of employees found their own names over the doors of their business or profession, if every employee went to his task with such zest, with such keen delight and such vivid anticipation. How quickly we should then see the business millennium. Instead of allowing children to grow up with the idea that earning a living is something to be dreaded, a disagreeable necessity, they should be made to feel that the bread and butter side of one's occupation is only a mere incident in one's vocation. One's occupation ought to be the calling in which he manufactures joy as well as a living. Our children should be taught that they will find their Eden of satisfaction in their vocation. They should be trained to think their life occupation is a grand privilege, which will bring supreme joy, if they find their right place in life. They should realize that there is no such thing as drudgery in the work one loves, that it is a perpetual delight, a glorious privilege. The youth should go to his occupation every morning with as keen anticipation, as he would go to the amusement which he loves best. Chapter 13, Turning the Water of Life into Wine If it is a dark day, never mind, you will lighten it up. If it is a bright day, you will add to the brightness. Give a word of cheer, a kindly greeting and a warm handshake to your friends. If you have enemies, look up, pass them by, forget and try to forgive. If all of us would only think how much of human happiness is made by ourselves, there would be less of human misery. A certain aged woman, whose face is serene and peaceful, seems utterly above the little worries and vexations which torment the average woman and leave lines of care, though trouble has by no means passed her by. The fretful woman asked her one day the secret of her happiness, and the beautiful old face shone with joy, says the woman's home companion, my dear, she said, I keep a pleasure book. A what? A pleasure book. Long ago I learned that there is no day so dark and gloomy that it does not contain some ray of light, and I have made it one business of my life to write down the little things which mean so much to a woman. I have a book marked for every day of every year since I left school. It is but a little thing, the new gown, the chat with a friend, the thoughtfulness of my husband, a flower, a book, a walk in the field, a letter, a concert, or a drive, but it all goes into my pleasure book, 
and, when I am inclined to fret, I read a few pages to see what a happy, blessed woman I am. You may see my treasures if you will. Slowly the peevish, discontented woman turned over the book her friend brought her, reading a little here and there. One day's entries ran thus, had a pleasant letter from mother. Saw a beautiful lily in a window. Found the pin I thought I had lost. Saw such a bright, happy girl on the street. Husband brought some roses in the evening. Bits of verse and lines from her daily reading have gone into the pleasure book of this world-wise woman, until its pages are a storehouse of truth and beauty. Have you found a pleasure for every day? The fretful woman asked. For every day, the low voice answered, I had to make my theory come true, you know. The fretful woman ought to have stopped there, but did not, and she found that page where it was written, he died with his hand in mine, and my name upon his lips. Would it not be well for more of us to follow this dear old lady's example and keep a pleasure book? Blessed are the joy makers. Fortunately for the world there are people who take a delight in mere living, who look upon life as a priceless gift, who delight in their work, who really enjoy everybody and everything, and who always give you the impression that they feel that they were born just in the best time, and in the best place in the world. The cheerful man carries with him perpetually, in his presence and personality, an influence that acts upon others as summer warmth on the fields and forests. It wakes up and calls out the best that is in them. It makes them stronger, braver, and happier. Such a man makes a little spot of this world a lighter, brighter, warmer place for other people to live in. To meet him in the morning is to get inspiration which makes all the day's struggles and tasks easier. His hearty handshake puts a thrill of new vigor into your veins. After talking with him for a few minutes, you feel an exhilaration of spirits, a quickening of energy, a renewal of zest and interest in living, and are ready for any duty or service. He gets the most out of life who realizes the latent treasures invisible to most eyes, who sees beauties and graces where others see only ugliness, deformity. We all know sweet, cheerful, inspiring characters who have the wonderful faculty of turning the common water of life into the most delicious wine. Their presence is a tonic which invigorates, which helps us to bear our burdens. Their advent in the home seems like the coming of the sun after a long arctic night. They unlock the tongue, and we speak with the gift of prophecy. They are marvelous health promoters. I see our brother, who has just been ill, lives on Grumbling Street, said a keen-witted Yorkshireman. I lived there myself for some time, and never enjoyed good health. The air was bad, the house bad, the water bad, the birds never came and sang in the street, and I was gloomy and sad enough. But I flitted. I got into Thanksgiving Avenue, and ever since then I have had good health, and so have all my family. The air is pure, the house good, the sun shines on it all day, the birds are always singing, and I am as happy as I can be. Now, I recommend our brother to flit. There are plenty of houses to let on Thanksgiving Avenue, he will find himself a new man if he will only come, and I shall be right glad to have him for a neighbor. A lady who was recently asked how she managed to get along so well with disagreeable people, said. It is very simple. All I do is to try to make the most of their good qualities and pay no attention to the disagreeable ones. The people who help us most are those who, like this lady, ignore, or rather try to eradicate, our faults, by drawing out and emphasizing our better qualities and attuning our minds to high ideals. Few people are large enough to rise above their aches and pains and disappointments. The majority are always talking about them, projecting their dark shadows into your atmosphere, cutting off your sunshine with their clouds. Their ailments and their hard luck and misfortunes seem to be the biggest things about them. 
You never meet them but they thrust them into your presence. So to order one's life as to keep, amid toils and suffering, the faculty of happiness, and be able to propagate it in a sort of salutary contagion among one's fellow men, is to do a work of fraternity in the noblest sense, says Charles Wagner. The man who is not big enough to rise above the things that trouble him, who cannot overtop his aches and pains, annoyances and disappointments, so that they are of little consequence in comparison with his great life aim, will never become really strong. There is an unwritten law for people who are thoroughbred, the real gentleman and the real lady, which compels them to keep their troubles, their ailments, their sorrows, their worries, their losses, to themselves. There is a fine discipline in it. It mellows the character and sweetens the life. But when these things are not born heroically, they mar the character and leave their ugly traces in the face, their hideous forms appear in the manner and disfigure the whole life. Learn to consume your own smoke. If you have misfortunes, pains, diseases, losses, keep them to yourself. Bury them. Those who know you have them will love you and admire you infinitely more for this suppression. A stout heart and persistent cheerfulness will be more than a match for all your troubles. In one of the battles of Crimea, a cannonball struck inside the fort, crashing through a beautiful garden, but from the ugly chasm there burst forth a spring of water which is still flowing. And how beautiful it is, if our many hidden sorrows become a blessing to others, through our determination to live and to do for those who need our help. Life is not given for mourning, but for unselfish service. Resolve that you are too large to be overcome by trifles, that you will be larger than the things that tend to annoy you, that you will overtop them with your gladness and cheerfulness. In one of Goethe's stories there is a description of the rude fisherman's hut which was glorified by the light of a little silver lamp. The doors and roof, the floors, the furniture everything in the hut was transformed into silver by the magic of the silver lamp. So a single sunny soul transforms many a poverty-stricken home with brightness and good cheer. We receive more of the true fortune the world about us has to bestow, if we try to win our wealth from nature and from other personalities by an invisible cheerfulness. Here is a bad, disagreeable day, as we call it, says Dr. Savage. Shall we become unhappy because we get sprinkled and the black of our boots is spotted, or shall we learn to think of the wonder of the great forces that throughout the universe are playing round our little planet, sometimes bursting through in sunshine, again draping the heavens in clouds, sometimes lifting up the waters and the dew from the ponds and the rivers and the lakes and the grass, again dropping them down in rain or sleet or snow, and so keeping the great forces of life and the changes of the world going their marvelous rounds? There is beauty in the leaden sky, there is God's wonder in every drop of rain, there are marvels that are infinite in a flake of snow. Shall we forget all this, and merely be troubled because they happen to come at a time when we who, in our egotism, would desire to manage the universe, would have had the weather a little different? I know a lady who has been confined to her couch in a small room for years, and can see only the tops of trees from her resting place, yet she is so cheerful and hopeful that people go to her with their troubles and always go away comforted and encouraged. Oh, isn't the spring beautiful, or summer, autumn, or winter, as the case may be, is her exclamation to callers, even when her body is quivering with pain. Her eyes are always smiling. Will anyone say that this woman, who has brought light and cheer to all who know her, is poor, or a failure simply because she has been confined to that little room all these years? No, she is a greater success than many a rich woman. She has the wealth that is worthwhile, the wealth that survives pain, sorrow, and disasters of all kinds, that does not burn up, which floods or droughts cannot affect, the inexhaustible wealth of a sunny, cheerful soul. Happiness is not an accident. It does not live in things. 
It does not depend, as most people think, upon having money or not having it. It is a little more convenient, a little more comfortable, we admit, to have money, but there is not such a very great difference between riding in an automobile or fine carriage and riding in a street car, not so very much difference between the comforts in a palatial home and a very modest one, if clean and neat, and love dwells there. In fact, love is very often a stranger in palaces. There is very little comfort or happiness in any home where affection and sweet confidence are absent. Kindness of heart, charity, helpfulness, unselfishness, love, honesty, sincerity, simplicity, sympathy these are the most desirable things in life. These are the things we are all trying to get. If we do not have them ourselves, we are trying to get close to those who do possess them. To save the life of a girl whom he had never seen before, Willie Rue, a crippled newsboy of Gary, Indiana, recently offered to give his withered leg for skin grafting. The young woman was discharged from the hospital cured, but the anesthetic given to Rue before the operation had been too much for his weak lungs, pneumonia, developed and death resulted. As death stiffened his fingers, a rose, given him by the girl for whom he was sacrificing his life, fell from his hand upon the coverlet of the hospital cot. I'm glad, he had whispered a few minutes before the end. Tell her that, that I'm just glad. And then when his foster mother knelt beside the bed and hid her face in the edge of the boy's pillow, he reached out a weak hand and stroked her hair. Don't cry, mammy, he begged. I never mounted to nothing before, and now you know I done some pin fair somebody. Conscious to the last, he kept smiling, while the nurse and the surgeon in the room, filled with emotion, turned their faces away to hide their tears. I count this thing to be grandly true, that a noble deed is a step toward God, lifting the soul from the common clod, to a purer air and a broader view. What a wonderful world this would be to live in, if we all made a strenuous effort to obtain the things that are really worthwhile, things that make for an unselfish, joyous character. How quickly the millennium would come if everybody was kind, unselfish, and true, buoyant, clean, and honest. We would have no need of penitentiaries or courts of justice. The golden rule would everywhere be the law of life. Next to the duty of self-denial comes the duty of delight. What ripeness is to an orange, what song is to a lark, what culture and refinement are to the intellect, happiness is to the soul. As vulgarity and ignorance betoken a neglected mind, so unhappiness and misery proclaim the neglected heart. The normal nature will keep strong and fresh the chords that vibrate joy. A cabinet officer once said to the late Charles Dana, who was fairly bubbling over with the enjoyment of his work, well, Mr. Dana, I don't see how you stand this infernal grind. Grind? Said Mr. Dana. You never were more mistaken. I have nothing but fun. I have told you, says Southey, of the Spaniard who always put on spectacles when about to eat cherries, in order that the fruit might look larger and more tempting. In like manner I make the most of my enjoyments, and though I do not cast my eyes away from my troubles, I pack them in as small a compass as I can for myself, and never let them annoy others. We are all richer in happiness material than we think. There are a thousand unrecognized, unutilized wellsprings of joy within us. Just think what a person who has been blind and deaf from birth, with a soul in tune with the beautiful and the true, would get out of the things in our everyday life, which seem so common and sordid to us, if they were only given a temporary use of their lost eyesight and hearing. What joy they would get out of the weeds by the roadside, which are distasteful to us, and out of the sounds in the street, which only annoy our ears. Why? we are all infinitely richer than we think. Our faculties have not been cultivated to seize, to appreciate and enjoy a tithe of the multitude of things all about us, 
which would entrance the souls of those who are deprived of all opportunities of education and training. Chapter 14, Longevity and Happiness The face cannot betray the years until the mind has given its consent. The mind is the sculptor. We renew our bodies by renewing our thoughts, change our bodies, our habits, by changing our thoughts. Last Sunday a young man died here of extreme old age at 25, wrote John Newton. George Meredith, on the celebration of his 74th birthday said. I do not feel that I am growing old, either in heart or mind. I still look on life with a young man's eye. You cannot tell how old people are by the calendar. You must measure the spirit, the temperament, the mental attitude, to get the age. I know young men who are in their 60s, and old men who are in their 30s. Old age seizes upon ill-spent youth like fire upon a rotten house. No one is old until the interest in life is gone out of him, until his spirit becomes aged, until his heart becomes cold and unresponsive, as long as he touches life at many points he cannot grow old in spirit. To live on without growing old, to feel alive and hold, to the last, whatever is best in youth, vigor of mind and freshness of feeling then, when the end has come, to find in the depths of the soul the belief of earlier years, and to fall softly asleep with a sure hope, is not this an enviable lot? The youth cannot understand why the close of the day does not have that, wild gladness of morning, it has riper, richer hues. The sunset is just as beautiful, and often more glorious than the sunrise. The last of life should be just as beautiful and grand as the first of life, the last of life, for which the first was made. Age has its pleasures. If the life has been well lived, the reminiscences are grand, the satisfactions beautiful. Indeed, what can give greater pleasure than to look back upon a life well spent, lived usefully, beautifully, fruitfully. When we arrive at the port of old age, after a rough passage over a stormy sea, there is a feeling of rest, of completeness, of safety. It is said that, long livers are great hopers. If you keep your hope bright in spite of discouragements, and meet all difficulties with a cheerful face, it will be very difficult for age to trace its furrows on your brow. There is longevity in cheerfulness. Time does not touch fine, serene characters. They can't grow old. An aged person ought to be calm and balanced. All of the agitations and perturbations of youth ought to have ceased. A sweet dignity, a quiet repose, a calm expression should characterize people who are supposed to have had all that is richest and best out of the age in which they lived. There is no justness or fairness in ranking people by their years. People ought to be judged old or young by their mental condition, their attitude toward life, their interest in life, their youthful or aged thought. If they face toward youth and optimism, if they are hopeful, cheerful, helpful, enthusiastic, they ought to be classed as young, no matter what their years may say. The elixir of youth which alchemists sought so long in chemicals, lies in ourselves. The secret is in our own mentality. Perpetual rejuvenation is possible only by right thinking. We look as old as we think and feel because it is thought and feeling that change our appearance. Mental poise means mental harmony, and harmony prolongs life. Whatever disturbs our peace of mind, or upsets our equilibrium, causes friction, and friction whittles away life's delicate machinery at a rapid rate. Few know how to protect themselves from rasping, wearing, grinding, disintegrating influences in their environment. Nothing else more effectually retards age than keeping in mind the bright, cheerful, optimistic, hopeful, buoyant picture of youth, in all its splendor, magnificence, 
the picture of the glories which belong to youth youthful dreams, ideals, hopes, and all the qualities peculiar to young life. Keeping alive that spirit of youth, Stevenson used to say, was the perennial spring of all the mental faculties. What a mistake we make in associating the great joys of life with youth. Everywhere we hear people say, Oh, let the young people enjoy themselves. They will only be young once. They will come into the troublesome part of life soon enough. Let them be happy before the clouds come. It is estimated that the person who lives a perfectly normal life will experience infinitely greater joys and will be much happier in his seventies than in his teens. When a man has reached middle life or later, he is largely the creature of his habits, and he cannot develop entirely new brain cells, new faculties. We enjoy the exercise of the faculties which we have been accustomed to use, the faculties which have been most dominant, active, throughout our lifetime. One reason why many people have such a horror of old age is because they have made no provision for their occupation in their declining years. They spend all their energies in making a living, and do very little towards making a life. The curse of old age is a lack of interesting mental occupation, and it is usually due to an early lack of training for an interesting old age. The mind that is vacant is a mind distursed. To avoid mental old age ought to be everyone's ambition. Not having formed the habit of reading, in youth, very few ever cultivate the habit and taste for reading late in life, and the result is that many people find old age extremely dreary and monotonous. A person who has always kept up the habit of improving himself, reading good books, thinking and contemplating great truths, who has developed the love of art and beauty, and who has cultivated his social faculties, finds plenty of employment for his last years. One of the most pathetic pictures in American life is that of the old men who have retired, but had nothing to retire to, except their fortunes. They had never prepared for old age enjoyment. In their younger days they did not develop the qualities which make leisure even endurable, to say nothing of enjoyable. Everywhere abroad we see the retired American who feels out of place and homesick, hungry for the exercise again in the office, in the store, with the customer and the checkbook. He cannot talk and laugh as he used to with his old college mates and friends, for even his mirth and enthusiasms have evaporated. No matter how hard he tries to enjoy himself in the art galleries, the concert halls, the yard stick, customers and schemes for making more money keep revolving in his mind, and strangle all the efforts of the finer sentiments to assert themselves. The things which he could have once enjoyed so much now only bore him. Some of the most disappointed men I have ever met have been men who retired after having made a fortune. Years of leisure looked enticing to them when they were struggling so hard in their earlier days to get a start and in their later days to accumulate a fortune. Their imaginations pictured a blissful condition when they could lie abed as late as they chose in the morning, do whatever they felt like doing, instead of being prodded by that, imperious must, which had held the lash over them for so many years. And the beginning of their retirement was so blissful that they thought they had never before really lived. But very soon the days began to drag, and they discovered that their lives were not fitted to enjoy very much outside of the routine rut between their office and the home. After retirement their faculties which had been used in mental wrestling with men and things, in the barter of trade, soon began to atrophy, that which had been their strongest hold gradually faded out and left no adequate compensation. They soon found that their real enjoyment was in the exercise of their brain cells, that when they tried to find satisfaction and real enjoyment by the use of faculties which had not been developed, which had been little used, there was no corresponding satisfaction. In boyhood the family necessity forced many of these men to find work, and their early education was neglected. The whole train of their business lives had been in an entirely different direction, away from the things they are now trying to enjoy. 
How frequently we have heard of men who after acquiring a fortune, have retired in robust health and at the very height of their mental vigor, and yet shortly after went into a decline and in a few years died. Of what use are books and pictures and statues to him who has robbed his intellect of all that deepens and enhances life's value? There is no greater self-deception than that which impels one to give the best part of himself and the best years of his life for something which he hopes to enjoy when the fires of youth have departed and there is nothing left but the embers and ashes of age. An observing writer has said, How many men there are who have toiled and slaved to make money that they might be happy by and by, but who, by the time they came to be fifty or sixty years old, had used up all the enjoyable life in them. During their early life, they carried economy and frugality to the excess of stinginess, and when the time came that they expected joy, there was no joy for them. The man who has trained his mind, who has prepared himself for the enjoyment of his retirement in his late years is a fortunate man. If a man has richly earned his leisure by an industrious life, if he has tried to do his share in the world's work and has trained his mind for enjoyment after his retirement, he ought to be able to be very happy. There are multitudes of ways in which an educated mind can derive enjoyment. Think of the world of pleasure which can be found in books alone to a person who loves them and knows how to appreciate them. It is hard to conceive of greater delight. This would mean very little to the man who has spent half a century plodding away in the business rut and who has perhaps never read a book through in his life. Think of the enjoyment possible in the world of nature, of art, to a man who trained his aesthetic faculties, as did Ruskin, where every natural object, every flower, every plant, every tree, every sunset, would awaken delights that would ravish an angel. What delights await the man who has made it a life habit to improve himself, to absorb knowledge from every conceivable source? Who can imagine greater delight than that which comes from feeling one's mind expand, from pushing one's horizon of ignorance farther and farther away from him every day? There is no satisfaction in life like that which comes from helping others to help themselves, and the man who has kept this practice through his business career will find endless satisfaction and joy in retiring to this helpful life. It is not only the man whose entire experience has been confined to the narrow business or professional rut that finds life very disappointing after retiring, but also the man who has had early advantages, but whose absorption in his career has shut him out of the world of books, the world of art, beauty, and travel and closed the avenues of the social side of life, and destroyed the faculties that had found early enjoyment in these things. This has been the sad experience of men who have tried to find enjoyment after retiring, but discovered that they had lost their power of appreciation and enjoyment of things which they once loved so much. This was Darwin's experience. He was shocked to find that during his years of complete absorption in scientific studies, he had entirely lost his love for Shakespeare and music, that the faculties which presided over these things had become atrophied from disuse by nature's inexorable law, which is use or lose. We get our greatest happiness in the use of the faculties which have been long and habitually exercised. It is not an easy thing late in life to awaken new sentiments, new powers, new faculties, which have been lying dormant for so many years. It is the exercise of the faculties and powers which we have been using all our lives which is going to bring us the only happiness and satisfaction of which we are capable. By retiring, the average businessman relinquishes his hold upon the very faculties which are in any condition to give him the most satisfaction. He cannot get very much out of trying to arouse faculties which have been lying dormant for half a century and perhaps have never been thoroughly awakened or developed. I believe that the majority of men who retire not only fail to find happiness, but actually shorten their lives. How often we hear of men dying, just because they have given up the only thing they could do, and can find no other stimulant to exertion to take its place, like the horse which so interested Mr. Pickwick, 
which was kept up by the shafts in which it drew a carriage and collapsed when removed from them. If you would keep young you must learn the secret of self-rejuvenation, self-refreshment, self-renewal, in your thought, in your work, in your youthful interests. If you think of yourself as perpetually young, vigorous, robust, and buoyant, because every cell in the body is constantly being renewed, decrepitude will not get hold of you. I believe that the average person could extend his life very materially, and especially increase his capacity for both achievement and enjoyment wonderfully by forming the habit of excluding from his mind especially before retiring, all unhappy thoughts. In other words, if we could only learn the secret of what is called, in Eastern countries, orienting the mind, first emptying it of everything that can mar it or cause pain, and get the right mental attitude, the attitude of love, charity, of kindliness, of magnanimity, helpfulness towards every living creature, it would revolutionize civilization. There is something wrong when we wake up in the morning with careworn faces, when we feel cross and crabbed and out of sorts, when we feel so touchy at the breakfast table that everybody must handle us with gloves. There is something wrong, when we do not wake from sleep fresh, strong, vigorous, cheerful, bright, full of energy, vigor, ambition, eager to get to our work which is a perpetual tonic. It is not the troubles of today, but those of tomorrow and next week and next year, that whiten our heads and wrinkle our faces. One's disposition has a powerful influence upon one's longevity. People who fret and fume and worry, who nag and scold, who are touchy and sensitive, age rapidly. How can one have lines of age or weariness or discontent when one is happy, busy, and one's spirit is ever, ever young? I know an old lady who has such a sweet, benignant, serene nature that she has robbed old age of its ugliness. Frame your minds to mirth and merriment, which bar a thousand harms and lengthen life. Happiness is a great vitality generator, a great strength sustainer, and a powerful health tonic. A very fine old gentleman of the best American type, accounting for his advanced age and his advanced happiness, said, it is quite simple. Lead a natural life, eat what you want, and walk on the sunny side of the street. There's a cheerful, comfortable bit of advice that does not ask you to live like an angel or die like a saint. By a natural life the old gentleman undoubtedly meant that we were not to live in excess of our incomes, turn night into day, or abuse our bodies. By avoiding these modern temptations one avoids dyspepsia, apoplexy, and nervous prostration, and so, being normally healthy, one can pretty generally eat what one wants to. As for the sunny side of the street, that is the best bit of the old gentleman's whole creed. The crowd that travels on the shady side are a bad lot. They are such questionable fellows as worry, melancholy, greed, vanity, idleness, and crime. On the sunny side, however, it's a jolly crew that jogs along mirth, pleasure, success, health, friendship, love, good fellows all who help tremendously to have the burdens and double the blessings of this little affair we call life, and in whose company, blow high or blow low, it's always the fairest of weather. Pleasures belong to youth, joys to middle life, blessedness to old age, says Lyman Abbott. Therefore old age is best, because it is the portico to a palace beautiful, where happiness is neither withered by time nor destroyed by death. Yet one need not wait for old age. He who in the prime of life has learned this secret of immortal happiness can with Paul bid defiance to all the enemies of happiness. He welcomes troubles as contributions to his happiness because builders of his character, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience, experience, and experience, hope, and hope mocketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. The greatest conqueror of age is a cheerful, hopeful, loving spirit. 
A man who would conquer the years must have charity for all. He must avoid worry, envy, malice, and jealousy, all the small meannesses that feed bitterness in the heart, trace wrinkles on the brow, and dim the eye. The pure heart, a sound body, and a broad, healthy, generous mind, backed by a determination not to let the years count, constitute a fountain of youth which everyone may find in himself. Oh, youth! For years so many and sweet, tis known, that thou and I were one, I'll think it but a fond conceit, it cannot be that thou art gone, the vesper bell hath not yet tolled, and thou were I a master bold, what strange disguise hast now put on, to make believe that thou art gone. I see these locks in silvery slips, this drooping gait, this altered size, but springtime blossoms on thy lips, and tears take sunshine from thine eyes, life is but thought, so think I will that youth and I are housemates still. Of those who live life to the full of usefulness, service, and enjoyment, it may be said. Age cannot wither them, nor custom stale their infinite variety. The End you have heard The Joys of Living, Volume 2 by Orison Sweat Marden, a creation of rich and spiritual.